Good morning, everyone. Are we ready, Mr. Ling? Everything has gone in? And welcome to City Council meeting held this day on January 19th, 2023. Councilman Maniscalco. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's my pleasure this morning to um, welcome a, uh, a frequent visitor here to uh, Tampa City Council to give the invocation, uh, Pastor Nance, who is a friend to many of us and a familiar face whom you know. Um, sir, if you'd like to come to the uh, lectern and please stand for the uh, invocation and remain standing for the pledge. Well, let's pray. Our Father, we just want to thank you so much for your grace and your kindness upon us. And Lord, we want to thank you for your multitude of blessings. Uh, and Father, we thank you for the city of Tampa and how you have blessed us. And Lord, how you've just uh, protected us and kept us in so many ways. And we look to you and just want to praise your name for that. Lord, as we come to the city council, Lord, we know that this is uh, a body that makes uh, many decisions and uh, discerns the direction of our, of our city. And Lord, we pray that you would grant them wisdom and favor and help. And Lord, I, I just pray that you would give them, Lord, what they need. I pray that you would be with our mayor. I pray that you would be with our uh, law enforcement. I pray that you would bless their homes, bless their lives. And Father, we just want to thank you for uh, the love that you have for us and the protection that you give to us on a daily basis. Lord, if there are special burdens in this room, Lord, I pray that you would help and minister to those. And we want to tell you that we love you and we're thankful for you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Roll call. Carlson. Vieira. Maniscalco. Here. Hurtet. Here. Goose. Here. Miranda. Here. And Citro. Thank you very we much. I will entertain a motion to set the uh, minutes of our regular session held on January so 15th. Moved. January 5th, excuse me. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. Is there any discussion? Any changes? All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Motion has passed. Uh, let's go through the approval of the agenda. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Mr. Shelby. Yes, just very briefly. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of City Council. Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney. A quick motion, please, to waive the rules to continue CM, uh, CMT uh, as set forth in the notice and the agenda. Thank you. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor? Aye. Is there any opposed? Aye. Thank you very much. All right, we will go through the agenda item now. First, we will hear, not at this time, but we're going to talk to some, we're going to have conversations with uh, Zoo Tampa. Uh, administrative updates. I have, uh, we are going to have two things come up first at administrative uh, updates, we will be discussing the uh, proposed charter changes. Also, we have our Black History Month, I believe, is also going to be administrative for agenda item number two. Then we will be moving up uh, agenda item number eight and 37 to be discussed during the administrative updates. Chief Bennett. Good morning, Council. John Bennett, Chief of Staff. Good morning to our public as well. Um, it's my understanding from the agenda review yesterday that, and I don't know if Mr. Shelby can help us here, but there's several walk-on items. And then we, we had sent a memo in to um, have item uh, two, 37 brought up to two, and item eight brought up to two to support Chief Tripp's timeline. Um, so whatever pleasure is, Council, between the walk-ons at item two, we're here to support. Thank you. Okay, can I have a motion to move both items so move, eight second. and 37 up and to, to have discussion of the uh, charter, proposed charter amendments and uh, the Black History Month. Councilwoman Hurtak. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Motion made by Councilman Goose, seconded by Miranda. Councilman Miranda. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? 
Thank you. We have a resolution for agenda item number three and four. We have resolutions for five and six, and I believe Mr. B. Day is going to be with us, and we will hear those at the same time. Also, resolution for agenda item number seven. Agenda item number eight, which is Councilman Carlson, or are we still going to be having a live in person? Yeah, you said you're moving that to number two, right? That's correct. Yeah. Number nine? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Number 10, Councilman Carlson? Uh, yes, please. Okay, number 11, which is Councilwoman Hurtak. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely second. Uh, Ms. Duncan will be talking 12 and 13 at the same time. And along with that, mm -hmm. items number 27 and 28 will also be discussed at that time. 27, 28. Agenda item number 13, Councilman Carlson. Yes, 13, 14, yes. Okay, thank you very much. 15, yes, 16, yes. Thank you. Maker of the motion is me for 17. Uh, yes, please and thank you. Uh, number 18, Councilman Carlson. That is, uh, I believe that that has been yeah. requested to move to February 23rd. So moved. Second. Second. We have a motion made by Councilman Carlson, seconded by Councilman Man Miranda, all in favor say aye. aye. Is there any opposed? Move to approve the agenda Second. and the addendum. And the addendum? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda, all in favor? Aye. Is there any objection? And Mr. Chairman, I don't know if we can, we should do it now or then, but item number 59, there's a request uh, that the item be continued to April 20th, 2023. That is a 130 meeting. We okay. will have to right. come back after lunch. You got it. Okay, everything's set? <clears throat> Let's do some critter talking. <laughs> I believe we have representatives from Zoo Tampa here. Good morning. I'm Joe Casero, I'm the CEO of Zoo Tampa. I have the privilege of working with a bunch of really good people and a few neat, neat animals as well. I'd like to introduce Ronnie Allen, who is, manages our ambassador program which reaches out to all of our guests with up-close encounters, not just at the zoo, but in outreach capacities like this one. Ronnie, would you like to tell them a little bit about what friends you may be playing with today? Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry, if you wouldn't mind, it would be easier for the cameras to be able to pick you up and you can get to the microphones as well. Well, welcome everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with all of you this morning. My name is Ronnie, like Joe said. And this is Kirsten, one of my teammates. This here is Charlotte. She's a prehensile tailed porcupine. And this is Silvio. He is a southern vested tamandua or anteater. Um, so at Zoo Tampa, our ambassador program, our goal is to inspire guests and to connect them with wildlife in an up close and personal way, um, just like we're doing with you guys today. So it's our privilege to be here. Um, these animals are both native to South America. And there are over 500 species native to South America that are currently endangered. So um, it's a huge goal of ours to uh, connect uh, people with wildlife and uh, try to connect them with ways that they can help their species, either from Florida or wherever they may call home. Thank you, Ronnie. Yes, sir. Any questions on our critters? <laughs> Councilman, please. Council members. I just want to say about the zoo in general that uh, these things would have been possible if it wasn't for your leadership and everyone under you. Uh, every time I visit the zoo, uh, even from the walking in where the people greet you at first, they're just all first class. They smile, they say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and they treat you with dignity and honor. And uh, without that, the zoo could have never done what it did. And I'm sure you're going to speak about it, but I'm not trying to steal your thunder or anyone else's thunder, but which all of you, every employee, yourself and everyone that visit there, you have set records that, uh, and I'll let you talk about the records later on. <laughs> I'm not gonna go there, but it, it's just an amazing thing and I hope that the zoo continues to grow as when, when I started in council back in the 70s, not that I stayed all the way from the 70s to here, let me clarify <laughs> that. It is something that the people that come on vacation, we were never a destination point. We made it a destination point because of the aquarium, because of the zoo, because of the strass. There was nothing downtown other than the strass and the jail when I started. And what you folks have done, all of you, you'll be commended for because 
the gratitude that you have in receiving all these people from all over the country and all over the world, really. It's an amazing thing that you've done. And it's made the Tampa citizens much happier, much enthused, much involved in the climate of the world. And you guys are to be recognized for a lot more than this. But I want to say thank you to each and every one of you for doing what you've done, what you continue to do, and what you will do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, I just want to say thanks to all of you for your leadership and for all the uh, companies and people that sponsor the zoo. Um, you know, when the when this zoo was designed, I don't know how many years ago, um, it was a really innovative design. And similar to the airport, it's something that has uh, that makes uh, people in Tampa proud and gives us a great name all over the world. Um, people, when they talk about great zoos and great facilities, they talk about uh, Tampa. So uh, thank you for all you do, and um, thank you for... I don't know if you're gonna talk about expansion plans today, but thank you for continuing to innovate and evolve because um, uh, there's more of the story uh, to tell and uh, I know you all have some exciting plans. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Please, I, I heard a, a figure or a statement besides the attractions, which is Disney, Bush Gardens and, 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 and Legoland, Zoo Tampa is the number one destination attraction in the state of Florida is did I hear that correctly no, at some point yes sir the number one cultural institution in the state of Florida meaning zoos aquariums museums and so forth that's amazing right here in our city I can remember when uh, back in the 70s when I was in high school going to Zoo Tampa and the expansion and the growth especially now with the big cat uh, exhibit you guys have had and uh, I hear there's other things that are planned like rescues and hospitals I can't wait to see the outcome of that. Thank you very much for bringing your staff, everyone back in the back there, and these wonderful animals for us to see. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. We, uh, we're here today to just kind of give you a snapshot of where we are as far as the zoo is concerned and where we're going. We're also going to give you an update on some of the work that we've done with John Bennett and uh, Nicole Travis and, and her staff in order to be able to update a lease that has been outdated for years and we finally, I think, have made progress to the point where you'll be able to have that presented to you and hopefully approved going forward and taking care of some items. So we'll get into a little bit more detail here in a minute. But first of all, let me just talk about who we are and maybe more importantly than who we are, why we are. Next slide, please. Our vision, everyone we touch is motivated to join us in taking action to protect and preserve wildlife. You know, that's, you sit down in meetings and you spend five hours coming up with every word and every comma and so forth in a vision. I kind of believe that I'd like to be able to show you what this means rather than tell you what it means. So with that, if you can be patient with us for about a minute and a half, we'd have a video to show you. Sound. Young, get to where they're going and protect one another. In the human world, together is how we bind one generation to the next. It's how we learn, how we play, and how we create the memories that make us a family. Together is at the heart of everything we do at Zoo Tampa. We bring animals from all around the world together so we can protect them, care for them, ensuring their survival for years to come. But we also bring people together so they can see these amazing animals up close and learn more about our unique relationship with them. Here, an environment's carefully created to meet the needs of each species. The furry lives comfortably alongside the feathered. The savage exists peacefully beside the gentle. And some of the largest creatures in the world never cease to amaze some of its smallest. Different animals from all over the world together. Different people from all walks of life together. Connecting with each other to each other and the way nature always intended, together. Plan your visit to Zoo Tampa today and discover our world together. 
I think that gives you a little bit better idea than a bunch of words on a page. You know, we have the privilege of working in that environment every single day and welcoming guests every single day, and the quality of the presentation needs to be the same uh, at a very high level every single day. We need to make sure that we continue to progress. And when I arrived uh, a number of years ago, about seven years ago, the zoo had about 700,000 people in attendance and about $15 million in operating revenue. We're at now 1.2 million and we're about $45 million in operating revenue. So we're making progress. But we feel that we can do a lot more. And let's first start with where we are so you can get an idea of the progress that we have made. And then we'll talk a little bit about where we'd like to go going forward. Karen Jabril is our CFO. She's going to take you on the next stage of the presentation. Thank you, Joe. Good morning, Council. My name is Karen Jabril, and I'm the CFO of Zoo Tampa. And I will brief you, briefly take you through uh, some key accomplishments and performance trends. Um, uh, as was already mentioned, we had another record year in attendance, and we are the most highly attended cultural institution. Um, but in, a distant, in, in addition, we continue uh, to provide manatee care leadership during an unprecedented year. Uh, we are very honored to be named Tampa's 2022 Employer of the Year by the Mayor's Alliance for Persons with Disabilities. And I hope that all of you have had an opportunity to see us on Secrets of the Zoo Tampa. This is a highly rated uh, series on Nat Geo Wild and Disney Plus. Uh, we've premiered, uh, we premiered in 2020, and we are airing our fourth season now, and we have a total of 36 episodes. Uh, we do reach a global audience, and um, that not only increases the awareness about the zoo's mission, but it has also brought a diversified audience base to the zoo, which is also a boon to the, to the city of Tampa. Um, this attendance graph uh, is basically a high level or big picture snapshot of the attendance trend historically and our projected attendance trends through 2026. And what this shows is that back in, in fiscal year 15, we were around 700,000 guests. And through fiscal year 22, we have grown to almost 1.2 million. And we are projected to grow to almost 1.3 million by fiscal year 2026, and that's just in the next four years. Um, our operating revenue trend shows that back in fiscal year 15, we were um, at around 15 million in revenue we have grown to almost 45 million, and we project to grow to around 54 million um, by 2026. And this is um, a compound annual growth rate of 11.6%. So I told you I was, would be brief, so that, that's what I have, and I would love to turn this over now to Scott Rose, our COO. Thank you. Good morning, Council. I am Scott Rose. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Zoo Tampa. And as Joe mentioned earlier, uh, we've been working with city staff to revise the, uh, the zoo lease that we have with the city. And first of all, I'd like to thank the staff uh, for <clears throat> collaborating with us uh, to get us, uh, we're just about at the, at the finish line here and we'll have that to you very soon uh, for your review and, and ask for the approval of it. Um, <clears throat> as you may know, the original lease dates back to the uh, 1980s and the last time it was revised was in 2011. So it, it was time for a re, uh, revision for that. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we uh, deleted outdated provisions and updated and simplified the language that's in the lease to more concisely summarize the lease history and eliminate old provisions that no longer apply, like language on construction of uh, the original zoo facility. It also eliminates ambiguity regarding ownership of animals. Um, the original lease included an animal inventory of animals initially provided to the zoo. Through the years, that ownership has transitioned to the zoo, uh, and uh, now all of the animals, as clearly stated in the, in the lease, all the animals are under the ownership of the zoo, and only the zoo is licensed to hold and care for these animals. It also updates insurance provisions. Uh, the city has improved its insurance uh, requirements over the years, and this update will incorporate those and bring those standards uh, to today's standards of the new requirements. Also, um, it includes adding a parcel of land to the lease. This is a, uh, uh, the parcel of land where the band shell is currently sitting. 
It's about a four acre parcel that runs from Hamilton Creek south to the uh, corner of Sly Avenue and North Boulevard. Uh, this is important for us because it will allow us to then uh, do some much needed renovations and improvements to our parking lot, uh, which really addresses a number of issues. One issue it addresses is safety. Uh, we have a number of safety initiatives that are part of this parking lot improvement, including the removal of the band shell. Uh, the band shell is in disrepair. It's uh, uh, non-operational. -operate uh, it hasn't been used in about eight years and provides us with a real uh, safety issue that we have there. It's the site of where a lot of the school kids uh, have their lunches and families visiting the zoo have their lunches and all. So we plan to remove that and uh, uh, rebuild that whole picnic area around there. So real nice facility for school kids and, and families visiting the zoo. Uh, other safety issues it'll address is vehicle uh, traffic through the parking lot, uh, pedestrian traffic, safety uh, railings, uh, improved sidewalks, improved crosswalks, uh, really just to, to address and make it a safer and much more enjoyable experience in, in parking. And the other thing it allows us to do is expand parking into that parcel. There is a small parking lot there now. We intend to expand that and connect it to the main lot. Parking is a real challenge for us. Uh, we run out of parking on many days of the year. As Karen indicated, our attendance has grown significantly. So we, we have, we're looking for a number of ways to improve the parking capacity uh, for, our, for our guests. Once we finish all of those improvements, we'll be partnering with the city uh, to manage the parking lot and add the park mobile system, which the city has in all the parking areas here downtown and, and, and other areas. Uh, so we'll be uh, uh, partnering with the city on that. It's a uh, revenue share model and that uh, projections will uh, deliver a revenue stream to the city of approximately two hundred thousand dollars per year which will continue to grow as our intent our attendance grows so once again we're finalizing the language in the lease and uh, we'll be delivering it to you for review and approval very soon happy to entertain any questions Councilman Carlson yeah, I um, thank you for, for doing that. And thanks to, this is the first time hearing about all the details of it. And thanks to the administration for being open to changing this. Um, uh, you know, one of the issues is that the, uh, sorry to mix metaphors, but the, the animals have been a political football over the last 10 or 20 years. And especially the last administration used that as leverage against the zoo. And I'm glad that this administration is open to fixing that. It, it was an absurd requirement um, that somehow the city would own animals that were born at the zoo <laughs> and um and so I, I thank you to everyone for working on this i look forward to seeing this and uh the zoo is very important we need enlightened leaders like you all to, to think ahead as our population is growing um, i didn't say this before but my kids grew up going to the zoo um, back when i was at the university of tampa in 1985 or 86 i <laughs> i filmed my first movie for a class project at the zoo i had to um, it, I think it was Passage to India or something like that, and so I had to, had to shoot zoo animals and, and piece it together. So um, the zoo has been a part of my life for a long time, and I um, uh, look forward to having my grandkids and others go there and participate. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Maniscalco. Uh, real quick, you know, we love the zoo ever since I was a kid. Now I take uh, my stepdaughter there, my oldest stepdaughter, uh, she'll go day after day. I mean, there's some weeks where if we can, you know, my wife will take her Monday through Friday Good. and, uh, and she loves the animals. She loves what, you know, what it is, you know, for, for, for kids to enjoy, but also as you know, Tampa grows and you've touched upon, or it's been touched upon before <coughs> the attendance, the amount of people that come here, I think we beat out any other, are we the largest in the state of Florida by attendance, is that correct? Uh, largest cultural facility. Okay, yes. so the interest is there. I think the investment is worthy. I know that you know we've talked about expansion and I've seen videos on the projects and whatnot, but it's a, it's a very significant community asset and expanding upon that will only benefit this community. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to support you know, the zoo and its plans moving forward and whatever we can do, thank you. We appreciate that support. Anyone else? Councilman Miranda. Let me just say thank you and growth has been benefit any business that's satisfied with a constant same attendance is in essence dying because somebody's going to take the other share. So what you've done is amazing, all of you. And besides that, if anyone listening is having a bad day 
and you feel like you don't feel so good, if you can find a parking spot, go park at the door. <laughs> We're working on that. Well, I'm, 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 I'm trying to get to where I'm going. Uh, if you feel that way, find a parking spot, park, and don't even go in. Just stand in the exit door, and when you see all the kids smiling and how they feel, your day becomes a better day because you see all this glory and all this feeling of what they've seen, that they've heard about, maybe seen it on television or something. But when they get there and they actually see the animals, they're in a different world. And when they come out, you'll be in a different world because you, the expression of being not too well becomes a very positive when you see that. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. And uh, we have some exciting expansion plans. I'm going to turn it back over to Joe to let him tell you all about it. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for the work. That's one thing I haven't heard mentioned is the, the work with rescue and uh, especially manatees right now. This in the last couple of years has been a really uh, struggle with, with uh, keeping manatees alive. Um, when I went to visit the zoo, you all had just released two manatees who could uh, fend for themselves and they had brought another one in. And I'm glad to hear that you're gonna be doing the expansion for rescue and re rehabilitation as well. Yes, it's a big part of what we do, major focus for us. And I have seen some amazing shows at that band shell over the years. Everything from a punk band, Zenith Nader, to uh, everybody's childhood, Melanie, who did the brand new roller skates. Uh, but maybe it's time for change. You said it hadn't been used in eight years, and I haven't seen anything there right. in eight years. Maybe that's, right. that's time for a change. Good. Um, I'm sorry, Chief Bennett, did you have something you wanted to add? I'll wait till done. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Scott. So the good news is that we set a goal for ourselves. We worked hard at it. We put together a business plan, a strategic plan. We put together a master plan. We've achieved our, our vision, if you will, for the first few years that uh, the current administration at the zoo has been there. But we do have a bigger vision. And some of you have seen this. And some of this, when, when we talk about a bigger vision, it's not just simply about the zoo itself. It is about manatee rescue. As a, as a matter of fact, we're adding two more pools to increase our capacity for more uh, manatee patients. We're, adding more outreach vehicles so we can go in the field and take care of these manatees. And it's not just manatees, it's Florida panthers, any native Florida wildlife that we can rescue. Our brand essence, we call it uh, unforgettable natural connection. You saw some of those unforgettable natural connections just with these animals and what Ronnie and her team do every single day. But an unforgettable natural connection is the things that happen between our animal care staff and those manatees as they care for them and try to rehab them. An animal connection is a little girl feeding a giraffe for the first time and making a lifelong memory that they'll never forget. Another unforgettable natural connection is mom watching her little girl doing that, and that's a, a memory that they won't forget. So we know perfectly well that our uh, goal here is that we need to continue to provide those unforgettable natural connections, and we need to take care of Florida wildlife as best we can and to try to inspire others to take action. So going forward, we have uh, we, we want to serve the, the needs of the Tampa community. Uh, I said this line about five, six years ago at one of our social functions, every great city deserves a great zoo. We feel we're a great zoo, but we can be greater. And just like Tampa is a great city and it can be greater, I think we can transform. Some of you have seen this video, but I'd like to show you our vision for the future. Zoo Tampa, an iconic zoological park with a legacy of higher standards in entertainment, education, conservation, and most importantly, in making vital connections between guests and the natural world. Now, as our resilient Tampa Bay area transforms, so does Zoo Tampa. It's a visionary plan that began with the transformation of the Florida realm, the opening of Roaring Springs, and now a totally reimagined Florida Wilds. Nowhere is the zoo's conservation mission more deeply expressed than here, a sanctuary for Florida wildlife, including gators, black bears, and the ruler of the realm, the Florida Panther. Friends and families will experience up close moments as panthers roam across an expanded habitat with unforgettable face-to-face -face encounters 
creating a bond with this rare endangered species. It's a story of connection that continues with Manatee Rescue Center. The journey begins with a new manatee overlook that offers a bird's eye view of these majestic sea mammals and the opportunity to learn about what threatens their survival from the dedicated team who care for and return injured, sick, and orphan manatees back to Florida waters. Already the largest nonprofit manatee critical care center in the world, the new Manatee Rescue Center will expand the zoo's acute care capacity with the addition of a nursery pool for the most dire and vulnerable patients. The adventure continues as guests step into a wondrous world of aquatic marine life. From seeing manatees gracefully swimming underwater, to an immersive encounter with stingrays, to meeting playful otters up close in their own riverbank oasis, it's an unforgettable journey of discovery with the goal of inspiring guests to help preserve Florida's oceans, coastal environments, and sea life for future generations. From here, the transformation continues into South America. It's a new realm with an expansion that would bring the zoo to the Hillsborough River, delivering an entirely new way of connecting with wildlife. It begins with cultural roots, tying Tampa to South America and the Caribbean, a century-long heritage that comes to life as guests are transported through the sights, aromas, tastes, and feel of the continent. Visitors will take in memorable encounters with sea lions, giant river otters, jaguars, and a wide range of other incredible South American species, culminating with a waterfront dining experience, partnering with local brands featuring authentic cuisine, and even a margarita or a mojito. The only thing that could top the experience is a rival from the river. It's a new level of enjoyment but one that never loses sight of the conservation mission and our critical role in inspiring action that help protect wildlife and wild places. It's that commitment to conservation that takes us further into the future. To the expanded Africa realm, a boldly reimagined home for some of the world's most majestic species. Here, guests encounter giraffes, elephants, zebras, rhinos, now all together in an expanded multi-species habitat that rotates daily, so it's a new experience with every visit, made even more memorable with a cabana rental on the edge of the savanna, a home base for the day, and a sensation come nightfall as campers sleep within a lion's roar. The Africa realm ensures that endangered and vulnerable species thrive and are appreciated at every level. At the all-new Gorilla Habitat, it's a three-tier journey, starting with Red River Hogs at ground level, then climbing higher to side-by-side -side encounters with gorillas, and finally, eye-level moments with a variety of primates high up in the treetops. Every step in the trek leads to lasting connections and an understanding of critical ongoing conservation efforts. A similar takeaway is found, a short stroll and a continent away, amidst the species and habitats of the transformed Asian realm. Here, overhead paths blur the line between visitors and animal habitats. One never knows when or where an orangutan or tiger might show up, delivering amazing nose-to-nose -nose encounters. It's a wonderfully reimagined home for current favorites with improved environments befitting a zoo that remains true to its high standards, confident going forward. As the Tampa Bay area continues its remarkable journey, Zoo Tampa forges a visionary path beyond the horizon. Join us at Zoo Tampa. The future is now. So before I take any questions, let me make a couple of things uh, clear. Number one, this is not in the lease. The lease inc incorporates what Scott talked about earlier. This is for ongoing discussion. It's a little bit more complicated issue. Number two, it's a 20-year plan that will cost about $125 million. We're not asking any money from the city. We are planning on funding it through other sources and, and finding ways to do that over that 20-year period. The important part here is uh, that we also want to respect the integrity of Lowry Park. 
And so we're not looking to infringe upon the public access, uh, any public access at Lowry Park. So those are the disclaimers we have. Hopefully you can kind of get an idea of where we'd like to go in the future. We'd like to do this with your involvement. We'd like to do this with your feedback. We'd like to do this with community meetings that we have with our neighbors so we can get their feedback. It's a work in progress, but we're very excited and we're very optimistic that we can get this, this done. Any questions? Councilman Mascapo. Thank you very much. First, this is spectacular. Wonderful idea and a wonderful way to activate the riverfront. Uh, as you see, that property is where we have our vehicles, where we have storage. I go through that area and it's, it's not very well kept. Uh, you all, I mean, you, you know that because you work right there. You answered one of my questions, how much money do you want uh, in public dollars, but uh, you're saying that you're funding it uh, through a variety of sources that are not public funds from us, correct? I should be clear, Charlie Miranda gives us a check every year, so <laughs> aside from that. So besides, besides, besides <coughs> Councilman Miranda, no, we're not asking for okay. anything. Um, I think this is a great use and, and way to activate the riverfront over there. The renderings were, were there, the access points. Um, my question is this, Lori Park, the public access spot that the city of Tampa has, um, I've had uh, requests and complaints regarding the docks and everything. Would you be willing as part of this project to take over the maintenance or the rehabilitation of that area? Absolutely. Okay, that's about a million dollars because that's the, the figure that I received and what we would budget for to fix that. But at the same time, there's an empty area, which is parking, uh, the dirt area on that lot. I'm talking east of North Boulevard. Would that remain parking and public access? There's a small area, and Mark, I'm going to have you take them through the, uh, the, the over overhead uh, image here. But there's a small area that is currently parking. Okay. That would remain parking so that if we have any events on that side of the park, we're not asking people to park on one side and travel through the zoo to get to the other side because this would be connected over North Boulevard with a treetop boardwalk. Okay. So there would be small parking for events. Uh, we would have river access so we can work with the water taxi folks, Troy's here today, and we've been working with them to try to create access that would be facilitated by this design. Uh, but let, let us show you what we have in mind, Mark. Yeah, um, Councilman, what you're talking about, I think, is the area in the the pink sort of here to the right. Yep. And um, that is the, the area that we're talking about for the actual zoo expansion is in the green primarily. And so this is this would be um, potentially uh, public access with with restaurants. We, we sort of like to look at it as maybe river walk north. OK. And um, extending the river walk up to um, this part of the the city okay so you will be uh, protecting the existing parking for public access you would be taking over the maintenance or rehabilitation of the docks and whatnot I was just mentioned um, what else you're not asking for public funds from us from the city yeah. from the city and uh, basically all you're asking is for the land which is being used for storage of vehicles and maintenance and all that stuff uh, so it's in, in uh, as the deal would be, the land swap, you would take over, you would fund everything, you would take over the, uh, the, the existing Lori Park dock area and fix mm -hmm. that, which that's a million dollars that I don't have to chase in the budget. And that's really it. I mean, I, I, I know you need the public uh, input and you're gonna be reaching out to folks, but I think this is a great and worthy uh, community benefit that takes the burden off us in many ways. It maintains the public access points in, in the park and improves upon that and expands upon that. And it's not costing the taxpayers, meaning the city of Tampa. You're not asking for money for our budget to fund this. So my questions are answered. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Hurtak. No? Councilman Goose. I see our economic director all shaking her head, so maybe she has some comments on that because she's shaking her head like, uh, so I want to make sure we're clear on the deal or, or what could be a deal. This, I think, yeah, I think we need to be clear that, that this is not a done deal by any means. 
This is yeah. not an ask today. Yeah, I was just going to say good morning. Nicole Travis, Administrator of Development and Economic Opportunity. The presentation for you today was to give you an update on where the zoo is and kicking off their um, renovations and expansions. This Everything east of Boulevard is not a done deal. This is things that we have mm -hmm. to work out um, to say that we're um, that it's only a million dollars, we would have to relocate city facilities. We don't have land um, or the resources to do that now. That's something that we're working out mm -hmm. and talking to the zoo about. So there's several different iterations and processes, as Joe mentioned earlier, that we need to go through. So um, the land is, um, it may not have a dollar amount, but there is a monetary figure associated with that. Um, but we're working on the lease amendment. That should be coming to you very soon. And this kicks off for the zoo, what they're hoping to endeavor in the next several years at the, as they expand and move forward. So there's several more steps to come before that, um, be able to get there. Um, and that will come before you at another time. Yeah. And you, as you can imagine, it's a complicated you know, to, to relocate and, uh, and all of that. So we're working with uh, Nicole and her team in the mayor's office to to see how we can best do that. Thank you, Councilman Miranda. Thank you very much. I, I uh, always been told to speak your mind. So I'm thinking about what my mind's going to say to that. Let me put it this way. If today that portion of the land that we were just discussing was to be reviewed by some other higher agencies, Brownfield doesn't have enough money to clean it up. So the population, the property of that land right now, it's got to be for some purpose that we're talking about, related to. And, and let me say this. When we talk about monies, it's amazing how some events cost the city $250,000 every time there's an event by contract. It's also fun to me to say that first two million dollars of some agency doing something in that property goes to somebody other than the city. That's a fact. I can go on and on and on. Not only that event, all events. So here's something that creates an audience not only for the kids, not only for the parents, but it's one of the driving engines. This and the aquarium was all we had. We had a convention center, which was very nice. It's as beautiful as it was, and it's almost old as I am. So when you look at those things, without a convention hotel, we were losing millions every year. So now those things are built out. The convention center's making itself profitable. It was last time I looked. And why? Because we helped make it that way by bringing in one hotel that brought in competition from another one and from another one and from another one that makes the aquarium and don't forget the streetcar that was done under the Greco administration. I think the cost was about 11 or 13 million. I'm not sure of that. That the people could ride. We used to roll up the streets at five o'clock in the afternoon. I was here when that happened. The crew's no longer working because what we changed from being what we were to something that the kids of the parents and grandparents that live here were living somewhere else. And now because of the University of South Florida, University of Tampa, University of Tampa has gone from 1,200 students a few years back to almost 12,000. It's bigger now than Wake Forest and Princeton in enrollment. So now what are we thinking about? We have an opportunity, fair opportunity, to have fair negotiations on both sides, not on one side or the other side. But to come to some agreement, and this is not an agreement that we're working on today, this is just a talk of what the zoo has accomplished on their own. There's no CRA in the zoo. There's no $5 million or $50 million or $20 million going to the zoo. These individuals are going to make it themselves. And that's what it's all about. So I'm not saying we shouldn't have done what we did. I'm just saying that there's a vast difference. And when you compare the apples to the oranges, it's not a fair comparison. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? My, uh, my girlfriend's eight-year-old grandson, who is a gamer, he's got the, the VR goggles <laughs> and all this. I looked at him, I said, hey, let's go to the zoo. The graphics are wonderful. You should see them. <laughs> Thank you for this presentation. And I look forward to the next time you coming here and giving us hopefully more good news. <laughs> Thank you, for, thank you for giving us the time that you have today. We appreciate it. And I just want to add one thing. If I haven't made it clear before, I want to make it very clear right now. 
the lease takes care of the immediate needs. You saw a snapshot of where we are presently financially, so we're in good shape. The video is something that's a work in progress, as Nicole pointed out. We felt that it was a better idea to take care of the immediate needs that's on the lease and then come back to this going forward. Because there's so many things to, to work out. There's so many obstacles to get through. But I'm a persistent kind of guy. And I'm pretty sure we can make it happen. We may find a hurdle or two, but we'll get through it. And again, I said it earlier, but I'll say it again. I want to thank John Bennett. I want to thank Nicole. I want to thank the team because they, they got help get us here. Going forward, we look forward to working with you collectively and individually. Thank you so much. Chief, did you want to add something now? Morning, Council. John Bennett, Chief of Staff. Just briefly, I think it was covered when uh, Nicole Travis came up. But we wanted to mention that we appreciate council recognizing the creative collaboration. I've had a special working relationship with the zoo for dozens of years, uh, mostly in protective measures and support of, of the environment. Um, and I just want to thank the legal team, Nicole Travis, Dennis Rojero, for all the hard work they're doing to get us across these phased goal lines. So it's a team sport, and I appreciate council recognizing uh, the fact that we're all working together to get it done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, is there somebody in the back that you want to introduce that is a colleague now? Troy. No? Yeah. And it, isn't Dustin with you? Nope. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, Dustin Portillo is our well, new we, director. We, of we all know him from prior uh, uh, accommodations, and I thought that maybe you might want to introduce him. Yeah, Please, Dustin, go ahead. come on up with me. So. Um, Good morning, Council. Uh, my name is Troy Manthe. I'm owner of Yacht Starship Dining Cruises and Pirate Water Taxi and a, uh, Bay Rocket and a couple other uh, floating uh, attractions downtown. This is Dustin Portillo, who's our new director of PR. Started this week, so a great first week. Um, we uh, are here to just express our support for Zoo Tampa. When you look at the, the investment they've made, I agree with everything you said. It's a world-class world zoo. It is the reason we have record visitation uh, here in Tampa. It is the reason hotels are doing as well as they are. We're having record bed tax. Um, we are committed to supporting the transportation corridor to the zoo. We operated a beta test, uh, the Zoo Express, prior to COVID running uh, up to the zoo. We learned a lot in that beta test. We spent the last year designing a specific water taxi that can make the transit from downtown to the zoo. We designed a catamaran with only eight feet of vertical clearance, which is a really a challenging task to get onto Hillsborough and Columbus bridges without them opening for us to transit to the zoo, capable of getting up to higher speeds to make the transit more timeable, low wake, jet driven, environmentally friendly. Um, and that vessel is under construction here in Tampa by Tampa workers at our maintenance facility. So we're committed to invest well over a million dollars in water taxi construction. This is the first of two we're building. We expect to launch it by the end of the year and we expect to stand up the Zoo Express route at the end of the year, early next year at the latest, which will start that connectivity again. And you're absolutely right, connecting the aquarium and the zoo together is essential. It creates a great all day experience. Uh, what we learned in the beta test, we had Full taxis going to the zoo, we had empty taxis coming back. Well, now we can fill them in both ways with visiting both cultural attractions. So we're very excited about that opportunity. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to Councilman discuss Brandon. that. I don't have a question, but say thank you for everything you've done and to, to help people and make Tampa like it is. You're right, the hotel uh, occupancy is one of the highest in the country. It's 80, 88% or 89% occupancy, one of the highest in the country. And, and thanks because you have something to go to. They have you moving around the the river and, and uh, entrance to the, to the bay. However, when uh, I've had a lot of people call me, and I'm more than one, I can have them call you if you like. North of the Columbus Dive Bridge, there's individuals that own property on the riverfront, and they're very much concerned because the, the wake doesn't go far enough, they say. And this is what they're saying. So wherever we're gonna do with the zoo, we gotta make sure that it's time-wise feasible that we don't have any not your boats, but other boats that are going high speed, and we have to have more village and more patrol. I know you're not gonna do that, but others might. And so we have to have a, a conference of the minds with the legal departments and review the wake zone in that area. Thank you very much. Anyone else? 
Councilman Carlson. Yeah, congrats, us. And, and um, Troy, um, thanks uh, for your entrepreneurship on this. What, what you've done uh, with the pirate taxi and other things, it, you know, it's changed the way people experience the city uh, by seeing and experience it from the Riverwalk. And I think when you started the pirate taxi, a lot of people, including me, thought it wouldn't succeed, and now it's wildly successful. So thank you for doing that. And also thank you for your leadership uh, with the maritime community over the years. Um, you and your family have been very involved. We appreciate it. Thank you. Councilman Hurtak. Um, I also just want to say thank you. I love uh, that you all are a uh, viable and growing alternate transit. So I just really want to say thank you for that. And I do see people on it all the time. I ride it myself and I really enjoy it. And I think it's a great uh, part of the city. So thank you for um, continuing to want to grow and to try to uh, allow people to just park once and be able to, uh, to move um, about our city in different ways. Thank you. Yes, thank you for your, uh, your new form of transportation, but it's not really new. It's only been around for, uh, what, 10, 15 years? What's that? The your, your water taxis. Water taxis are six years now. Six years old. Yes. But they are, they are a huge success. So thank you for all you do. And Mr. Portillo, great to see you back in council chambers. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we will now be taking public comment. Anyone in chambers that wishes to give public comment at this time, please form a line on my left, your right, and you will be given three minutes to give your comments. Hello, members of the board. My name is Al Lucas. Uh, I, came, I came to Tampa in 1958 and uh, went to uh, with my mom and uh, went to uh, Tinker Elementary School, Gorey and uh, Wilson and Plant and graduated from the University of South Florida. Mom buried, uh, married uh, Bill Ebsary, uh, remarried Bill Ebsary, and he was uh, once uh, the, the uh, president of the uh, Junior Chamber of Commerce here in Tampa and was also the chemist in World War II in Tampa. My job is to introduce my friend David Cornell, CEO of Low Cost Website, and he's interested in the, uh, the black experience and wants to help with the uh, renovation and restoration of the uh, Ray Charles building on Zach in Nebraska. Uh, he has, uh, he's writing a book about that, about that and uh, wants, is, is very interested in pursuing with you as you, with, we understand that you have that as a part of your agenda, the restoration of the Ray Charles building. So without any further ado, I'll introduce myself, I'll introduce David Cordell. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So well, I'm specifically talking about the Jackson House off of Nebraska and Zach. Um, as the council may be aware of, it was at one time for um, black musicians to go there and live. That house has been in a state of disrepair, disrepair for some time now, I believe 20, 25 years. Um, <clears throat> what I propose before this council is at a minimum to consider a plaque in honor of Ray Charles who did indeed go there. Because in this town there is a mural, a fine mural that honors Ray Charles and Ray Charles Boulevard, which he didn't live there by the way. But he did live in the Jackson House with the other wonderful musicians of that time. So I would ask this council to at a minimum consider a plaque in honor of Ray Charles, and maybe a little bit more, maybe uh, a statue of some sort, a humble statue showing him playing the piano right in front of the Jackson House. Um, also, as the CEO of Low Cost Websites LLC, which is in the same zip code of the Jackson House, um, I know people worldwide and nationwide interested in this particular project. I understand a fine university has established a plan for the Jackson House. And once again, it's a state of disrepair. I do not miss, wish to countermand that, but there's a company in California called, and I have the contact information here, the 
you all wish to see it. It's MBSAC, MBSA, MBSAP LLC, very well established company in California. And they have connections in India and Singapore and Saudi Arabia. There's a particular architect, as I conclude, there's a particular architect uh, that has some information that he'd like from Saudi Arabia to uh, facilitate with that project. So I ask this, the members to, at a minimum, consider that plaque and also a statue of some sometime, wherever Ray Charles may have dwelled, and to consider getting some information so this architect might be able to contribute. Thank you so much. Councilman Maniscalco. So when Ray Charles came to Tampa and lived here for a time, he stayed in a house on Short Emery Street. Not at the, he did stay at the Jackson house, but the house that he spent more of the time in, and I believe where some songs were written, has been demolished, but the property is there. It's, I believe, right next to the, to the existing church. I can, I can take you there and show you. Who I would contact, and I can connect you, is uh, with Dr. Uh, Carolyn Collins, and she would be the, the contact person there for the Jackson House in restoration and renovation. If, uh, if you want, I can step out and give you a business card, and uh, we'll help you with that. Thank you. Uh, and also, please consider that plaque and a statue in homage, because it's not much in homage of Mr. Ray Charles. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mentez not a huru. Huru means freedom in Swahili. We say we as African people should always be thinking about our freedom. And it's time for the stupidness to stop. We don't want to talk about no Jackson House. We don't want to talk about no Ray Charles. We don't want to talk about no black people singing and dancing and eating watermelon. We don't want to talk about no black people playing basketball or who got hurt on the football field or the Buccaneers or Tom Brady or tax incentives for them. Black people need to talk about reparations. Black people need to talk about reparations and white people need to talk about reparations for African people. 423 years we've been under oppression and domination and y'all talk about who you gave a plaque to, who can sing the best, who can dance the best, who can be an American idol. We don't want no more of that stupidness because we don't have any representatives to really represent our true interests. Ignorant Negroes talking about parks and recreation centers and speed bumps and roundabouts and say no to drugs and the white folks bringing all the drugs in the community. Say no to crime and they commit more crime than anybody else. Personal crime, social crime, political crime, economic crime, more crime than anybody else. Stop the foolishness. A raggedy house that's sitting there for decades that y'all won't fix, the city won't fix, and y'all using it as an insult to African people because that's exactly how we live it. Now y'all up here for an hour talking about a zoo and y'all ain't talking about reparations. We're 26% of this population. I don't know what the animals over at Zoo Tampa is, but we're 26% of this population and y'all can't talk about reparations not one single day, not one single second. Y'all are insult to African people. Y'all are an insult to African people and the ambitions of African people. And y'all still think we three-fifths of a human being. And we ain't never been that. But y'all try to categorize us as that and keep talking about y'all can have ceremonies and Martin Luther King parades and Juneteenth. Oh, nobody care about that ignorant stuff. It's ignorant. It's straight ignorance. And y'all trying to play us close like we ignorant. But black people aren't ignorant. Black people aren't foolish. We've been enslaved for 623 years under Euro and American domination, under white Western civilization, under white Western expansion, under white Western manifest destiny. It's time for that to stop. Y'all have to start taking black people more serious. We ain't trying to sing and dance with white people no more. We ain't trying to do none of that no more. We ain't trying to collect no plaques and no awards and no who did this and who got a marching band, a sorority, a fraternity. F all that. We want reparations. That's what we want. $623 trillion is what we're owed on, on this continent right here of North America. That's what we want. Thank you. Next, please. <clears throat> Well, 
Well, good morning. My name is Sid Flannery. I spoke to you on December 1st regarding proposed changes to the Florida statute that resulted from Senate Bill 64 that will affect how the city reuses or discharges reclaimed water from the Howard F. Curran Advanced Wastewater Treatment Plant. These proposed changes to the statute were prepared by the Citizen Stakeholders Group for that for the last two years has followed the city's plans to comply with Senate Bill 64 and its options for reclaimed water use. At your request, on December 1st, I sent you a draft of the stakeholders' position paper that contained our recommendations. And then on January 12th, I sent you, the mayor, and city staff our final document that has very similar proposed language. I'm here today because you also received a memo dated January 12th from two staff members from the city's Office of Government Affairs and Strategic Initiatives. I wish these staff members well and don't think the misunderstandings in their memo were intentional, but that memo seriously mischaracterized the recommendations put forth by the stakeholders group. <clears throat> As shown in item 13 in the staff reports for today's meeting and reprinted in the staff memo, on December 1st, the council passed a motion for city staff to examine the legal and lobbying resources that can be used to support a change in Senate Bill 64 and or enable the city to get an exception from the Florida DEP that recognizes the beneficial effects of discharges of water to Tampa Bay. <clears throat> I do agree with the staff memo that a full exemption from Senate Bill 64 would be an almost impossible sell with the legislature, but that is not what the stakeholders have proposed. Instead, in our position paper and my previous comments to you, we have been very clear that adding some simple clarifying language to Senate Bill 64 would not preclude the pursuit of reclaimed water projects using the AWT discharge. Instead, on a case-by-case -case basis, the city could evaluate reclaimed water projects that consider the large seasonal variations of flow in the Hillsborough River, the need for reclaimed water, and the cost effectiveness of the projects. Our recommended language would also allow the city to better respond to changes in site-specific factors, such as concentrations of chemical constituents of concern, and in an open scientific forum, evaluate the quantity of surface discharge that can be removed from Tampa Bay without causing adverse environmental impacts. Could I have just another more time? A little you bit. still have 30 seconds. Okay. For an accurate portrayal of the stakeholders' recommendations, I encourage you to review the email I sent to you on January 12th and the attached position paper that was signed by nine members of the city stakeholders group. As that correspondent suggests, we think the city administration should endorse and support the straightforward additions to the Florida statutes that we are proposing, which would give the city much needed operational flexibility to pursue reclaimed water projects that are truly needed, cost effective, protective of the region's water resources and natural environments, and in the best public interest. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councilman Carlson. Mr. Flint, could you, uh, I know you maybe have done this before, but could you just, for us and for the sake of the public, just tell us real quickly uh, your professional background experience? Uh, yes, I'm retired now. I'm 70 years old. I've worked in water resources for 38 years. I worked as a chief environmental scientist with the Southwest Florida Water Management for nearly 30 years, and I worked on minimum flows and levels, and that is the quantity you can take of water for water supply without damaging the environment. I've worked extensively on minimum flows for the Hillsborough River and the Alpha River. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. Good morning, Council. Good morning. I'm Gary Gibbons. I'm the Vice Chair of the Tampa Bay Sierra Club and a member of the stakeholders group on the project formerly known as PURE, which the city now claims is no longer a thing, but of course we all know is still very much a thing. In particular, I'm here to express the shareholders or stakeholders' disappointment in the city's responses to the 17 questions that the Sierra Club submitted to the mayor and her staff last February after Council provided more than a million dollars for public outreach and to study additional alternatives. We gave those 17 questions to the mayor and her staff and said, this is the minimum information that you need to tell the public about the PURE project. In fact, the 17 questions are titled, Outreach Information That the Public Needs from the City of Tampa Regarding the Proposed PURE Project. And we asked that all of that information be put on the city's website. 
So why are we disappointed? Well, first of all, rather than answering each of the questions one by one in sequence, the staff has chosen to group the questions in bunches and respond with their own narrative generalizations. So my first question for the staff is this. Why didn't you just answer the questions the way they were asked? You've had a year. Amen. Secondly, the document keeps, kept saying two things. One, we need more money in order to answer the questions. And two, there isn't a pure project. And they repeat those over and over and over again. Well, everyone knows that they want to use combinations two and three, which everyone has called pure for more than two years, which means stop discharging the water into Tampa Bay, put the treated wastewater in the reservoir to drought proof it, below the dam for minimum flows, and store the rest of it in the aquifer. So if that isn't pure, I don't know what else to call it. And I might add that the only project that the mayor and her staff have continuously advocated for is what is listed in the plan filed with FDEP in November 2021. So why not call it pure anymore? And while there's apparently a report of what the contaminants are that are contained, that remain in the treated wastewater today, they didn't send that report to the stakeholders or to city council, and instead it's available upon request. Really? The public's been asking for this information for almost a year, and now we have to make a special request for what's in the treated wastewater now? Why not put all of that on the city council's website, the city's website, so that everyone can see that information, just like we asked in the 17 questions a year ago? We certainly hope that the workshop that's going to be held on February 23rd will provide real answers to each of the questions posed without excuses that funding has been stopped. And while we're talking about money, the public would certainly like a detailed accounting of the money that's been spent to date on this project, whatever it's called. Thank you. Hello, uh, Noah Myers, Tampa Bay uh, Community Action Committee. It's funny that the zoo came in here because I just want to talk about the elephant in the room. Uh, yesterday, uh, Jane Castor, Mayor Jane Castor, vetoed uh, a ballot measure for independent counsel for the C Citizens Review Board of Tampa. Uh, a, ba a flagrantly anti-democratic option or action and I mean also kind of disrespectful to all of you. You guys spent like three months working on that ballot measure and she just is like out of nowhere just gonna unsign it? That's just, I mean, ridiculous. It's disrespectful to you folks, disrespectful to the city of Tampa, it's disrespectful to the people of Tampa, it's disrespectful to all the work you guys put in, all the work the activists put in, all the work everybody has put in trying to put pressure on this campaign. And I mean, y'all gotta stand up for yourselves, y'all gotta stand up for the people of Tampa, and you gotta stand up for what's right. Because I know every single one of you know what's right and what's wrong. And what, uh, what Mayor Jane Castor did yesterday was wrong. And giving uh, the Citizen Review Board power of independent counsel is right. So just do what's right and override that veto. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Shelby. M Mr. Chairman, members of council, a question came up with regard to public comment on the reconsideration of councils, um, <clears throat> the ordinances that have come back from the mayor. With regard to that, uh, a clarification, please. Um, is it council's pleasure to allow for public comment after each of the individual ordinances. Um, my understanding is that uh, it's not set for a public hearing, although frankly there may be people here who want to speak to the individual ordinances, or does council wish to have allow people also um, to, to speak generally if they wish to speak now instead of then? Um, how does council wish to handle it specifically? This is something that has not come up before council in my experience before for reconsideration. Again, um, I had an opportunity to speak with the legal department. I don't know if they want to uh, opine, but I understand that, um, and it's my opinion, that best practice might be under these circumstances to allow each individual ordinance to allow public comment if that's council's pleasure. Councilwoman Hertak. Um, I absolutely think that's a great suggestion um, because there are some people 
here that may want to speak on one, and some people may want to speak on maybe three, but not all five. Uh, so I have no problem with that. I would probably, the only thing I might recommend is that uh, um, folks try, you know, we, we normally, you know, try not to, you know, be too re uh, repetitive and, um, yeah, I, I absolutely have no problem with that. I think that's a wise way to do it. Councilor Carlson? Yeah, just one other thing to add to that. Um, I agree with Council, Council Member Hertek, but um, if there are people that came here with the idea of speaking in the public comment at the beginning and they need to leave, I don't think we should prohibit them from speaking now, but if, if we should, we should, yeah. One, but others who would like to speak later, let them allow, allow them to. Then if it's the pleasure of Council, I would take both considerations and say, if someone wishes to speak during public comment about the charter changes, let them do that now. If they wish to speak during each and every discussion on a charter amendment, let them do that, one or the other, but not both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shelby. Good morning, Council. Uh, James Michael Shaw, Jr. I live in West Tampa. Uh, I tend to show up behind this podium whenever we're talking about the, the CRB, and, and I, I thank the members of Council that have supported the efforts to give the CRB its own independent attorney. But really what I want to talk about right now is bigger than just that. It, we're talking about the separation of powers. The seven of you represent the 400,000 of us. You are the legislative body of this city. Uh, I've been speaking with various iterations of this, this council for seven years about the, the amendments to the uh, ordinance concerning the Civilian Review Board. So I think seven years is enough vetting for that that we can finally put it to a, a vote. There are different kinds of voter suppression. There is preventing someone from registering to vote. There is preventing a registered voter from casting a ballot. And the kind of voter suppression that we saw yesterday was the content of the ballot to make sure that it is whitewashed of, of things that will affect the outcome of the, of the voters' lives, the things that affect them, that even though if they, they, they're able to cast a ballot, the things that matter to them are not on that ballot. That's a form of voter suppression as well. I see some aspiring mayors in front of me right now, and I want you to know that you only get one this morning. You only get one opportunity to either stand up to voter suppression or sign off on it. And the voters are going to be paying attention to how you vote this morning. Let the people vote on this issue. Let the people vote on all of these issues. I read that editorial, and it just said, it's a strong mayor form of government, and I'm afraid that some of these might pass, and I don't want the voters to have their way. I will be deciding for them. I've said ad nauseum behind this podium that strong mayor is not two words that appear in the charter anywhere. They don't appear in any ordinance. It, it, there is pseudoscience. There is also pseudo-law. That is pseudo-law. There is no such thing. Strong mayor is a legal term that means the executive is elected by the people instead of hired by a city council whose mayor is, is whoever's the chair of city council, the weak mayor form of government. That's all it means. It does not mean that the city of Tampa is governed by a monarch who gets to decide what the people get to vote on and what the people don't get to vote on. So you have one shot this morning at either uh, signing off on voter suppression or standing up to it. Uh, I have to go to work, but I will be watching and the voters will be watching. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Taylor Cook. I'm a member of Tampa Bay Community Action Committee um, and I live in North Tampa off of Nebraska and Bush. Um, and I'm here today to speak about the mayor vetoing um, the charter amendments yesterday, not only because, as you all know, Tampa Bay Community Action Committee is a huge supporter of independent council and letting the people vote, but also there's other amendments in that charter, um, or other charter amendments that she vetoed that I also think are very important. Like, I think there should be term limits, and I think that a lot of those things should be up to the voters. They affect us, and I think it's also, a slap in the face for the people that come here very often to speak on letting the people vote and issues that we care about and that affect us. Um, I know in the past, TVCAC has been called a fringe group, but we all live in Tampa. It all affects us, and um, you know we organize in Tampa. 
And we represent people in Tampa, and people in Tampa want police accountability, and they want a chance to vote. They want to be allowed to choose how our city is run, and the mayor is not allowing that. But I think that you guys can, and we really hope that you will today. So thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name's David Jones. I live up in North Tampa, District 7. Uh, also speaking, and I'm asking that you guys uh, override uh, the mayor's vetoes on those charter amendments. Um, you know, what the mayor did yesterday was really just like kneecapping democracy, really just pulling the rug out from underneath uh, voters here in Tampa. Um, you know, it's disrespectful um, to us in the community, but it's also disrespectful to y'all. It's like disrespectful to us that, um, you know, everyday people in Tampa are getting caught up in the crosshairs between like city council and the mayor's office and whatever like nonsense y'all have been up to for this last year. Um, and ultimately that's not what um, any of us care about uh, in the city. Um, what we care about is like real accountability. What we care about is uh, making sure that our voices are heard when it comes down to these laws that keep getting passed. Um, you know, like a buddy was saying, we've been, people, folks have been out here for the last year talking about the Pure Project and there hasn't been any real updates or real like acknowledgement of what's actually happening. Um, people have been out up here since like, what, 2015 demanding more police accountability and there hasn't really been an opportunity for like our voices to be directly heard like we uh, would see through like uh, this ballot. Um, People have been up here um, demanding actual change and for the mayor to be able to just like side swipe that um, on a whim essentially out of the blue is just, you know, wrong. Um, it's wrong for folks who um, claim to like love and respect democracy. It's wrong for folks who claim to love and respect like the people that they um, rule over is not the word, but the people that they govern over, um, you know. Um, so I just ask that y'all override that ballot and you do the right thing. Uh, let the people vote. Let, let the people vote on what like matters to them. Uh, thank y'all for your time. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Shimmy Seabree. I'm a member of Florida Rising. I'm here to speak about the funding for the R3 program. There are people that still need funding. Um, I had COVID like last year and I still have up and down symptoms, so I'm able to work and I also need assistance for my rent. I had it in the past, but I still need more assistance. Um, basically, you know, I don't want to go back to being homeless. I slept in my car for many years. I slept at parks, beach, I bathed at laundromats and stuff. I don't want to go back there again. Um, this pandemic is an unnatural disaster. There was no plan for that, like it's like for hurricanes and tornadoes. So I think this should be a continuous thing until everything come back to normal by funding us for housing. Oh, it's just a lot of people that need it. I know that. So that's what I'm here to speak about. I don't want to go back to the park. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Caroline Bennett. I'm a lifelong resident of Tampa. I want to talk about the word impact. I want you to think about the word impact, what it means. When people move to this city, they have an impact. They have an impact on the infrastructure. They have an impact on our communities. That's why the city and the county have impact fees. It's right there in the name. One of the impacts of the new people moving here is that we need more public safety resources. We need new fire stations, we need new fire trucks, we need new personnel, and the police need, need these things too. So the people who are moving here who are having an impact are not paying for the need that is created by their impact on our infrastructure. The builders and developers who are in business to make a profit on the building that it, where the people come and move into are not paying for the impact. I'm paying for the impact. I am. I've lived here all my life, and I am sub subsidizing the cost of the impact of the new residents. Channel Side needs a new fire station. It can't be paid for out of the CRA, even though the CRA has tons of money. So instead, I have to pay for it, and everyone else like me who pays into the general fund. It makes perfect sense that we have a public safety impact fee because the people moving here create an impact. The other thing I want to talk about is the charter amendments. 
I have been here over and over and over again. I've seen on TV, I have looked on YouTube, I've seen the discussions about the charter impacts, I mean the charter amendments for months and months and months, a year or more I think is what it is. We all have had a chance to understand what is being proposed. You all voted on it. We count on you to be independent. We count on you to do what you think is right. We count on you to listen to us because unlike the mayor, and this is not a criticism of the mayor, but unlike the mayor, citizens, anybody can come before you multiple times a month, like I'm doing right now, and they can tell you what they care about and what's going on in this city. They can also call most of you and make an appointment, and you will sit down and you will talk to them face to face. That sort of access is not available to the mayor, and I'm not, that's not a criticism. There's seven of you, there's only one of her. But you have a much better idea of what is going on on the ground level in the city because you interact with the citizens to a much greater degree. We need you to be independent. We need checks and balances. There's been plenty of time to talk about this. We all know about it. Anybody who wants to know about it knows about it. So I'm asking you to vote for what you think is the right thing to do because that's what we want from you. That's what we expect from you. Thank you. Thank you. Can we see it? Good morning. My name is Stephanie Pointer. Um, I live in South Tampa. Everybody knows I live in SOG, South of Gandy. Um, uh, today I want to talk about number eight and number nine, um, and, and in particular our public safety programs. This uh, nifty little map right here is from the Firefighters Union, and this is from 2019. It said we needed 15 new fire stations. I have personally read the 2,000 pages of the last two years' budgets. There's no fire station planned. And this says we need 15. I watched Chief Tripp come up here a week or so ago and say they gave her all the data. In every other department in the city, they have somebody who does a study and it's a complete study and they give them a way forward. Chief Tripp's a wonderful fire chief, but she's not a data an analysis. These people did the work. It's already done. You don't even have to pay for a study if you pay attention to this. Um, we have 6,330 new apartments south of Gandy, west of Dale Mabry. But yet, we have not one additional fireman. We don't even have an EMS unit in our area. Um, and, and this isn't just our problem. I'm just, I know the data and the numbers for my particular area. It's throughout the entire city. I'm wondering why this isn't a top priority. And the safety impact fees, the public safety impact fees were asked for initially in 2021 by Councilman Dingfelder. And I'm sorry, Chief Bennett, I love you, man, but you got up here and said we didn't need them. And I, I very, very distinctly remember that. Um, and, it, and it hurt my heart at that point. These impact fees, when you've got 6,300 apartments, which are four-story units, which we didn't even have any four-story units when we started all this building south of Gandy. So we've got four-story plywood buildings that are being built, and we have no additional fire resources. What happens when one of them catches on fire? Seriously. I mean, it's something to very seriously consider. And they're falling apart. I have taken several folks on tours, and they are literally falling apart, and they're no, le they're no more than five years old. We have to start holding people's feet to the fire. It has to happen. Public safety is important, and it's obviously not in the budget. So where, wh why are we not spending this money on this? This is very, very important. We had a gentleman who died south, in South Tampa recently, because we, and we weren't able to get the folks down there. He probably would not have made it anyway, but that's not the point. And I'd also like to point out to you on the charter amendments, I'm sorry, but the, the mayor should be here. If she says no, she needs a woman up and walk over here and Ooh. say it to everybody's face. That's right. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Keela McCaskill. I echo, woman up and walk over. But based on this latest veto, it really gives me as a native as a citizen here in Tampa, 
I feel like it really doesn't matter what I want as a community member. It really doesn't matter what the community wants. It almost gives you a feel that you're almost a second-class citizen. So I've come to the realization that any hopes to be heard, you know, to get a message out or the desires of the community that I've heard from in the community, that comes from here. I can participate. I can interact with you all. I can call. You listen. You, you sit there. You respond as much as possible. But I just want to say to you that as disrespectful as it was to veto that and not come to the community, at least act like you give a you want to hear what we have to say. To do that and not interact with the community, I'm sure she probably met with you all individually and told you what she gonna do. Really didn't take your input. She told you what she was gonna do. As disrespectful as it is, Jane already knows she's gonna be the mayor for the next four years and we just gonna have to suffer and accept it. And I meant to say Jane, I know it's disrespectful, but I feel like she slapped me in the face, this a slap back. I feel like it's necessary. So I realize that it's gonna come from here. It's gonna come from you all. To be heard, it's gonna come from you. We already know it's a strong mayor form of government, but we need council members that's concerned with the people. I believe that most of you, you do care. You do care what we have to say. You do care what we want. And you understand you are the person that helps to make those things happen. She already knows she's going to be the mayor. But some of you is questionable. If we don't see the leader in you today, mm. why do we need you? We looking for mm. leaders. We looking for people that's not afraid. We're looking for those people that can stand flat footed, look her in her eye and say what's best for the people. Yeah. Everybody has to be accountable to somebody. I submit to you, she should be accountable to us, and she should certainly be accountable to you all. I'm telling you today, we're watching. All of you need some votes if you want to win, and we want to see today. We want to see that leader today before we vote you in. We want to see leadership today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Council. Robin Lockett, uh, I agree with everything that's been said thus far. Um, why not, why not let people vote? It baffles me. I've been in here, I, I was here in February when Pure was here and the 17 questions were supposed to be answered and, I, and not, from what I hear now, nothing has, uh, has occurred. I was here uh, throughout the time of this, the discussion around charter, the charter revision. Proud that y'all vote unanimously. So I have a lot of stuff written down, but my challenge to you is, how are you gonna change your vote? If you voted one time, mm. one way, mm. why not be consistent? Yep. Mm. So we shouldn't even be having this conversation. If you vote, you stand by your vote. We need consistency, we need a commitment. And like I always tell you guys, one person does not rule. What was said previously, we put each and every one of you in office. You're going to look for our support uh, on March 7th. You're going to look for our support March 7th. And how are you going to handle it? How are you, how are you going to handle what's going on right now? For each uh, amendment that was presented, I am so curious to see how brave you are to stand by your vote, to stand by your vote, regardless of the conversations that you've had, because I heard y'all had conversations on Friday about this with one, on, one by one. But how do you stand? So you stand up to one person or you stand up to the community, mm -hmm. the community that you come out and beg for a vote? So we'll see what happens uh, with, I'm anxious to see what happens uh, today in regards to your vote. Thank you. Hi, my name is Simon Rowe, and I'm here today because two months before a municipal election, um, on March 7th, we had the mayor decide to veto referendums that you all, as a collective, have passed. Uh, frankly, reading yesterday's op-ed was a surprise to me, as I'm sure it was to all of you. Um, it was also a surprise to see, you know, these vetoes come be claimed to be about transparency. What is transparent about releasing an op-ed on a Wednesday morning, not telling city council, not telling the community first, and making an override of the decision that we as a community wanted, that city council was okay with? She overrode all of us here. And to call that transparency, what was transparent about 
you know, having secret closed doors meetings before you were all were able to vote on, you know, the independent council referendum. The mayor is not operating in the light of day to let us have input on this decision. She is trying to supplement your decisions and the will of the people to obstruct our right to democracy and to decide how the city of Tampa is run. We are here today because we are asking that referendums like this do not die in the dark. We want to have more of an input here in the city and we talk about coming to city council meetings. I mean, how many people can speak in just one day? Maybe 50 if we talk fast? Thousands of people vote in elections. This is a chance to get an unprecedented level of input on the Citizens Review Board and on how the city of Tampa functions. And we're just, and I'm kind of disgusted that our mayor is trying to shut all of that down, kill it before it even gets to the election. And I'm asking you, don't let it die. Don't let it die in silence on a random Wednesday in January. Let this continue to the ballot so people can vote whether or not they can be here. Let us have an input on how the CRB is run and also that other referendum on electing department heads so we don't have a repeat of the embarrassment of former police chief O'Connor, a national level embarrassment of a department head you know, having, you know, abused her power in office. We are sick of seeing these abuses of power, deciding what's best for this community. We can speak for ourselves. We can vote for ourselves. We don't like being talked over. We are the ones who give transparency. It is not appointed from above. So, yes, please stand with democracy here. I hope you vote to overturn this veto so the entire community that you are supposed to serve can decide. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Council. Good morning. Nice to see you. Whoever wrote that uh, op-ed for Mayor <laughs> Castor yesterday was... Mr. Benjamin, we all know who you are, but yes. for the record, can you give us your name? Yes, for your... For your record, uh, Mr. Shelby, Kelly Benjamin, uh, 504 Fern Street. Thank you. <clears throat> um, whoever wrote that op-ed was skilled in Orwellian doublespeak, and I know that the council certainly sees through it. Um, the, the mayor wrote, our voters deserve better while denying the citizens of the city the right to vote on issues that will impact their lives and their communities. It's unbelievable. I know this, the, the, the city council sees through that. A rushed and haphazard process. I sat and watched these council meetings for months. It was a long, arduous process where you listened to the community and you considered what people were telling you. This veto is clearly an attempt, as was said previously, at voter suppression. And this council can either sign off on that or you can stand up for the citizens of this city who have been pushing for transparency, for dialogue, and opportunity to weigh in on these important issues, you can stand up for what's right uh, and, and, and not go along as a toady for a, mad, a power mad mayor who targets members of this city council when you defy her. This is a mayor that's responsible for, for biking while black and defending the renting while black program, the, the crime-free multi-housing program. And then she went against the, the, the voice of the citizens of this city and, and, and the advice of council and, and hired a, a police chief, uh, Mary Connor, where we all know how that went. I, I urge you today, the super majority of you, to please allow the people to vote as, as Mayor Castro said, the voters deserve better. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, man. Joe Robinson. In 24 hours, it'll all be set up. 24 hours. The last call, 24 hours. 12 noon, we're going to know what's up, what's down. And some people might be on there legally. We're looking into that. So you better get your stuff straight before 12 noon Friday. Mm -hmm. Warning. 
Uh, it's two and three sides of every story. This is the worst time to be running for office right now. The worst time to be running for office, man. I feel sorry for y'all. That's why I told y'all I ain't even gonna run. I'm gonna sit here and get my, each time you pop up to talk about them ordinances instead of getting it consolidated in three minutes. But I'm here to say that uh, hopefully uh, at 12 noon tomorrow, we'll know what's going on. We know who in, who out. We'll know the slate. We'll know what we got out there to choose from, you know, what we got to choose from. The, and the pickings is real slim, who contested and who ain't. So I just want to, you know, tell you guys that I don't have no issues with the city. When I do, I take care of them, right, Mr. Bennett? We pray on it. So bottom line is, is that uh, I'll be coming back. Um, it's being monitored rather closely, rather politically. And there's some people ain't saying nothing right now. I'm here to tell you, everybody up there is going to be checked out. So if you're filling out a Form 6, you better make sure you're dotting your I's and crossing your T's. I'm telling you. So with that said, here's the season soon to start, 24 hours. Good luck to everybody up there. Do what you're going to do, but be aware that there's consequences. There's consequences in this particular election. This is not like any election that I've ever seen since I've been in Tampa for over 60-some 60, 60 years. This is different. This is different because we've got different issues. You can hear the public is upset. You can hear the administration is upset. You can hear councils upset. Everybody's upset. Ain't nobody going to get what they want, I can tell you that. Nobody's going to get what they want fully. So it's called the art of compromise. It's called do your best out here. Some of y'all will probably be seen over at the at the uh, club luncheon, I guess, at the Cuban club. But I just want to tell you, be careful. Make sure that Form 6 is correct and dot your I's and cross your T's, please. Do we have anyone left in chambers that wishes to speak to public comment at this time? I believe we have two people online. Just one. Thank you. Mr. Randolph, if you could hear me, please unmute yourself. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Randolph, and I'm with the West Tampa Community uh, Development Corporation. First, I want to start off with a special announcement, and then I want to go back to the business of the West Tampa CDC. The special announcement is I'm no longer eating eggs. I'm paying $44 a month just to eat eggs, so I'm no longer eating eggs. I have to get that in. Now, related to the West Tampa CDC, on September the 8th at 7 p.m., we'll be doing our next uh, community-wide meeting talking about the strategic plan from 2023 to 2028. Among the topics that we're going to be talking about and what's on everybody's mind is the West Tampa Public Safety Initiative, which is going to focus on ending the school-to-prison pipeline, look at average youth, and returning citizens. Two years ago, I talked, to, or maybe two and a half years ago, I talked about the influx of guns that's coming as a result of the stimulus program. Based on what they say, there's more guns in our neighborhoods now than any other time before. You got kids going to school with guns. You got kids killing each other. So the West Tampa Public Safety Initiative is going to focus on that, but simply Generation Z and Generation Alpha. Generation Alpha was born between 2010 and 2023. And these people are starting to be the ones that are committing the most notorious violence in our neighborhood. The other thing we're going to be talking about is the West Tampa uh, Community Base and E-Commerce Initiative, which is looking at uh, working with over 100 residents over the next five years to start their own home-based e-commerce business. Also, those concerns coming from the communities related to the West Tampa changes in the school system, we're going to have the superintendent 
to address the issue related to West Tampa of schools. The other thing we're going to be talking about is the uh, West Tampa um, uh, CRA and the funding that's available for residents, community groups, businesses, etc. We're also going to be talking about the relationship with the Florida Department of Transportation, in which we're talking about over the next five years, hundreds of jobs that's going to be created for residents in West Tampa, but also businesses. We're going to connect those businesses also to the um, initiative. Um, the other uh, thing we will be talking about is the West Tampa um, Community Engagement Initiative. Over the next six months, we'll be uh, having the focus group of over 300 residents to talk about what is it that they want to see in the future. These groups include senior citizens, rental people, homeowners, youth, out of work people, and fixed income individuals. We're also going to do a follow up on the community road, road state project. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you, Mr. Randolph. Again, is there anyone else online or anyone else in chambers that wishes to speak during public comment? Thank you. Then I suggest we get right to the Charter Amendments. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney. For the record, what I have passed out to City Council, a copy to the clerk and a copy to the legal, um, is the um, summary and minutes of the January 5th, um, 2023 Council meeting wherein Council uh, took actions on item 81 through item 85 relative to the five, excuse me, 84 relative to the um, five ordinances being presented for second reading for council's consideration. Uh, you have received the memo from the mayor that is within the 14 days as uh, um, set forth in the charter. It is now bef it is now before you for reconsideration. And my suggestion would be that um, each ordinance be presented individually and um, uh, it, it being read by title uh, before you take final action um, as council has agreed to take any additional public comment as there is any, and if there's any input from uh, the administration um, as well or legal, um, that would be the time to be able to um, recognize them and move forward if you wish. Specifically, by the way, for the purposes of your consideration, uh, provided you this um, the summary in the minutes because what they do contain is they do contain and I'll confirm that with the clerk. They do contain the ordinances by title, which have to be read by title only. So you have those in front of you for each of the ordinances, as well as the votes that were recorded um, for those individual ordinances on January 5th. Thank you. Councilor Warner, okay. Um, my only question is, um, obviously, this is not a second reading. So is there any special language we need to use when, um, when making the motion? Uh, it, well, in that it's in front of you for reconsideration as operation by the Charter under Section 2.10, um, my suggestion is you just move it uh, as um, uh, on reconsideration and read the title by only. And again, Council, just so you and the public know that uh, pursuant to the sections uh, 2.10 of the Charter, a two-thirds Affirmative vote of all members is required, and again, that would be a, a, a supermajority or five or more votes. And again, anything, uh, a vote or four or fewer will sustain the mayoral veto. Council, would you please indulge me? Ms. Zellman. Good morning, Andrea Zellman, Legal Department. Thank you. You are the uh, city attorney. Correct. 
we have two branches of government, the executive and the legislative. We are the legislative body. We have the ability by ordinance or by resolution to change our laws and ordinances, to change our codes, to make changes to how this government is run. We have that power. That is our duty to our citizens. I asked before. I wasn't happy with the answer. I'm asking you, does this city council have the powers through ordinance or through resolution to do these same changes that we, we have proposed, thereby setting into motion that these changes will not have to go to the ballot and they can take effect in three weeks, give or take a few days. Do we have that power, the legislative power, to just enact all these things by ordinance or by resolution? Yes, I would agree with one exception, that being the term limits, and I'll get to that in a minute. But yes, I would agree that the other proposed charter amendments could all be addressed by either code amendments or by resolution of city council. Council members, carpe diem. Seize the moment. As the attorney for the ACLU, and I'll paraphrase, you never know what's going to happen at the elections. As Ms. Lockett said, and I will paraphrase, if we make these laws and ordinances, if we set these wheels into motion to achieve what we're trying to achieve, council members, if we would have done that two weeks ago, we wouldn't be here today. We, the city council, ladies, lady, and gentlemen, council members have the power to today say we want to achieve these things through ordinances or through resolutions. Let's show our backbone. Let's stand up for what the citizens want us to do, and let's, let's put this into effect, starting with making motions on resolutions and ordinances today. Carpe diem. Seize the moment. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, while I appreciate that, um, we actually got quite a few back and forth of whether or not we could do this by ordinance and resolution. And if we punt it, we're just basically having to start all over because today we can't put these into effect because these ordinances are about putting this stuff on the ballot. It's not about actually doing it. So we're going to start all over again. And I'm telling you, the public, is that's not what I'm hearing. That's not... Okay. What I, uh, and so what I'm saying is, while I respect that, that is not what we've been told by, by uh, the city attorney. And uh, at this point, the public is saying they want to vote. Yeah. Right. They don't want us to do it. They want to do it. It's and so I am absolutely uh, going to vote to override these and put them on the ballot like the public wanted. We all voted unanimously on four out of the five of these to put them on the ballot. The other one got a five to two vote. We already have the votes. We're just here to kind of just get it done. If, if, if I may answer to that, since this is our only open dialogue among council members, ladies and gentlemen, and if they don't pass at the ballot, and I'm not saying that the voters are not smart. They are. But if it doesn't pass, do we throw our hands up and say, we tried? Uh -huh. This way, going through ordinance or going through resolution, that is a definite answer. Um, actually, it isn't because councils, uh, um, future councils can overturn that. So no, it's not. But also, that's not what, what's happening today. That's, you're basically just starting the cycle all over again. And we already agreed. We already agreed. Unanimous votes on putting these on the council, or rather on the ballot for the people. And you know what? This, that's the thing. It, it is rolling the dice. But we all agreed. If the people don't want it, they're just going to vote no. It's not a big deal. And they're letting us know. They don't want it. I, or if they do want it. And again. How many members of this council sat on the charter review? 
any charter could be overturned again. So my point is, is that I would like to make sure that this goes into effect sooner than the elections. And I, I'm going to reply again um, that no, that in order for a charter to be overturned, it has to go back to the voters. So that can't happen with the seven of us or the seven people sitting here. It has to go back to the voters. So what the voters are saying is that they want to vote on all these things. So if you want to do that route, it's actually probably going to take longer to go through ordinance because we have first reading, we have changes, we have second reading, and then the mayor can veto them again. And we'll be here all over again. So it's, this is actually, in the, in the long run, probably going to be faster. Councilman Carlson. This administration has done everything they have could over the last two years to try to delay this and obfuscate this process. The reason why this has been delayed so much by the mayor's description in her op-ed is because her people pushed us to, uh, to delay it. Um, we would have had this passed a long time ago if not for that. Um, an ordinance can be changed by council. And keep in mind that the mayor and her predecessor right now are not happy with the votes of city council, so they're trying to manipulate the election process to get their city council. And in fact, the mayor is running her mother-in-law as a candidate. She's running her mother-in-law as a candidate. And, and the people of this community are not happy. This is a democracy. This is the United States. We have a separation of power. We believe in democracy in this country. Um, the city attorney and the staff of the city, they report as much to the city council as they do to, to the mayor. However, past city attorneys, not this one, but past city attorneys have misinterpreted the charter. They misinterpreted ordinances. Just last week, we fixed a problem. We fixed it by ordinance because we were told we shouldn't do it by, by charter. We fixed a problem that we're four years of liability out there um, uh, because a city attorney in two paragraphs overturned what the charter said and what an ordinance had passed in 2006 to put the city at legal liability in, in not allowing city council to approve um, uh, settlement agreements. It's ridiculous the things that have gone on in the city. The public is not happy. It's not professional. And the problem is that, is that uh, this, is, this administration looks at everything from a political lens Everything is a political campaign. We are here to set policy. Policy is about listening to the public, analyzing the facts, and creating solutions. It's not about who wins and who loses. It's not about who's going to run against whom. Because they've had a conspiracy theory for three and a half years that I was going to run against her, they've been constantly attacking me and sabotaging me. They helped work to get Dingfelder out, and they tried to get Goods out. It's despicable. You cannot use city resources to attack city council members who are elected by the public. You've got to respect it. And you should not participate and collude to throw out city council members in an election. It's despicable. And I will tell you, I somebody that there's a lot of discussion about the problems of city council or the conflict. It's all coming from the mayor's office. It's coming across the street. If you want to know where it is, go there. What's happening is we're standing up to it because we don't like it. And I, and I will tell you, I'm somebody who believes in collaboration. I'm someone who prides myself in being collaborative across the region, around the world. I've worked on collaboration. This administration does not want to collaborate. Last week, the mayor said in the media, I want to meet with every city council member. She hates me. Her staff hate me. They sabotaged me for three and a half years. How many of you would have gone to her office and met with her? I did. I changed my schedule and I met her on Friday morning. Chief of Staff was there as a witness. And I said to her, Madam Mayor, you have three choices. You can vote to approve, you can sign these and make a public statement, have a press conference and say, I don't like these, I don't support them. You can even campaign against them. But ultimately the public has the right to view them. And what you can say is I stand by the public's right to choose. Or you can veto them and send this city into political chaos. Right. You can reinforce the message that city council and the mayor uh, uh, don't get along. I said that last week. I said, I hope you don't do that because I want to get along. We all want to get along. We all want to work peacefully together. Why do you want to create political chaos? Number three, you can have a pocket veto, which will send us into a legal fight that will last forever. Thank God she didn't do that. Why would a sitting mayor want to, want to break the precedent of decades of city council and mayors getting along? 
to create political chaos. They come up with every excuse they can to stop this. They come up with legal excuses and legal interpretations that stop it. We could have gone through the most pristine process, following everything, and they still would have made up something to stop it. And, and none of this is substantive. How does setting term limits for city council disrupt this strong mayor form of government? It doesn't. They just want to win. It's just about politics. It's about a checklist of who won and who lost. And I will tell you, the other thing I said to the mayors, I presented like 22 different proposals because she called the other city council members. I lost every single vote. All of those were great suggestions for our community that would have protected our community. I lost every single one of them. I did not propose any of these. I said, you already won against me. Why are you still fighting these? But they want a political fight. That's what they're going to do. It is despicable. We should vote for these today, not to fight back, not to get revenge, because we should not be a political body. We should vote for it because it's what's right for our community. We're representing our community. And if the community votes it down, then we respect their decision. But we have to give them the right to vote. Thank you. Amen. Councilman Miranda. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it very much. First of all, this is only the second time and uh, since I've been sitting on council that this has come up for a review or possible conflict with the administration and the legislative branch. The first one was back in the 70s, mid-70s, over a vote for a pay raise for the firefighters, Local 754. And the three that led the firefighters commercial was Mr. Lorandi, Mr. Sonardi, and Mr. Urso. Those are the ones that represented the union at that time, as I see our brothers and sisters from the same local here today. That was denied by the mayor. It came back to the council, just like this is coming back. And it was overwritten by the council on a five to two vote. That's fine. And since then, there was a big article in one of the daily newspapers that called us all the firefighters five, which was nice. The newspaper did their story, and that's how they felt. And I agree that they have the right to do that. Let's get to where we're at today. When you start to review all these things, and if you look at number 80, I didn't vote for it. I said the process is tainted how we started it. Let's go back to when we put back the Citizen Review Board regarding the charter. We in council and then the mayor, a different mayor, worked together to put together individuals from this community in different sectors to represent the public in having negotiations and among themselves to think what was best for them to present to this council that was here then for the charter review. It took about a year. I never went to one of those meetings. There are, I think, three or four members here that uh, were part of that, uh, including some from the legal department, some just sitting now as council members. We did that. Did we do that in this process? No, it came from a council member who started it in this chamber. Right there in the process, I think there's something wrong about transparency. Let me say that going in. And I have no regards for anybody that they, they do what they want. See, I was born alone. I hope I die alone. And I don't mind voting alone. Those are the three things I believe in. So when you look at that and you look at what we're doing now, we should really have, instead of having all this BS, and I'm not talking about Barbara Streisand, to put on the budget, I mean on the election, do you want to change the city government? That's what it is. When, and I'll give you a, for instance, not too long ago, two or three months ago, we had an individual that we hired, Ms. Travis, we had a long process of having three or four individuals apply for a certain job, and that individual was qualified the most by this council and took the job. We voted on him, he came here and spoke. Guess what that individual did? He was much smarter than what I thought he was. He saw us on TV one day and called in and quit before he took the job. Am I right, Ms. Travis? So what message are we sending? That we're really strong or that we're really divided? I meet with the mayor once a month, and it's only about me as I'm not, that's not my position. That was a mayoral position from Mayor Greco, from Mayor Buckhorn, from Mayor Oriel, and now Mayor Castor, four. And I've sat on that board of Tampa Bay Water since 1998, other than four years from 2003 to 2007. That's the only time I sit with a mayor to bring that person, that mayor, and all the other mayors that before her on what was said at the meeting. I don't discuss nothing else other than pet the dog once or twice. 
And that's about it. So what I'm saying, when we start doing these things, there was not five or six, there was 20-some items that were done. If you're looking at 20-some items, you're looking at a change of the whole city. It's only we cut it down to this. But in that first ordinance, I voted no. And I said then that I'm voting no because the process was tainted. I said it then, you can check. The others, I voted yes to see where I was standing with that no vote. And I got the message loud and clear. I learned from what I learned in the past. You see, there's smart people, there are intelligent people, there are people that know a lot of things better than we do, and then there's people that just understand where you come from. There's why I fit in. I understand where I came from. I understand what a handshake means. I understand when my mother told me something had violated, I was going to have consequences. And I had consequences. I didn't always do what my mother wanted me to do. So what I'm saying today is we really want to change things, have a debate, go back, put a board in, go on and do the right thing. If you really want to do it right, let get input from the people we put on to tell the elected officials what they think it should be changed, not us changing the, the items without any contract with the people that we put in, on that review board. Those are the things that, are, to me, are unacceptable, and uh, I understand. I don't talk to any council members about anything regarding that. They do what they want to do. So here's what the process is today, and let's see where it goes. Councilman Vieira. Thank you very much. And thank everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, when I hear things coming out of city council, it, 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 the, the rhetoric we've seen, et cetera, et cetera, the rhetoric that has been encouraged, it really, really bothers me. I'm always the kind of person who believes that you can have both things. I believe that you can override a mayor's veto, right, and have a simple disagreement on things without being uncivil, without escalating tensions, especially in a political year when there's so much to gain. I walked in here intending to override on the vast majority of these and look into one, and if one resolution can't be done, then to go forward with an overriding. But I did not walk in here intending to escalate the political divisions that we're having in this city government. We hear so much rhetoric, uh, so much rhetoric. I, I, I was talking to someone yesterday when someone said the mayor, and again, by the way, disagree with the mayor's veto and tend to override. But somebody said, oh, the mayor is suppressing votes. It's voter suppression. It's authoritarian, et cetera. I said, well, let's say that a, a, um, a, a voter initiative came to you, you were an executive, and it was going to tear down labor unions, right? You would veto it because you oppose the substance of it. Is that voter suppression? No. It's expressing your opinion as a democratically elected official. Is what we're doing somehow out of bounds? Absolutely not, because we are elected officials acting pursuant to the charter, and that's what I intend to do. We do see a ton. Voter suppression is real, right? Since 2020, we've had about 250 attempts in over 40 states for voter suppression legislation. Uh, 2018, I remember Gov or, uh, Northern District Judge Mark Walker uh, struck down a, a bill by uh, Governor Rick Scott to preclude early voting on college campuses. Uh, we saw our Attorney General in Florida join Texas in trying to throw out the votes of, I think it was four other states that happened to go for now President Biden. Of course, we saw January 6th. Many, many issues of voter suppression. I just want to make sure that we frame issues as they are. When I hear language on that, including uh, authoritarian, et cetera, I just want to make sure that we stay within reasonable reality on this. Again, it is my opinion we're going to go forward today, and over, I, I think, and override the mayor's veto, but I want to make sure that we do not needlessly escalate the political rhetoric where it does not to need to be in this city government. We have a disagreement. I disagree with the mayor on these initiatives that she vetoed. I'm going to vote to override. There's one I want to inquire on and then vote to override. That's what I intend to do. But I want to make sure that the terms of the debate are fair and that they do not, again, escalate the political rhetoric in a city government where we are right now going over the edge on this. And we need to turn back just a little bit where we can disagree with one another, right, and not needlessly demonize one another. I, I, I think that we can do that here. Um, when I take a look, and I've said it again and again, these proposed ballot measures are not radical. They're very, very simple. I support them in substance, 
The voters want to vote on them. Let's go for it. No problems there. But that's a point that I do want to make because that's something that's very important to me. Um, I, I guess if you well, I mentioned a judge, you know, sometimes when you go on an opinion, you file what's called a concurring opinion. Maybe that's a concurring opinion here. But uh, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilman Mascaco. Oh, thank you very much. I wrote down what somebody said uh, earlier, and they said, vote for what you think is right and be independent. That's something my mother says. Do what you think is right. That's it. That's the advice she gives me, and think for yourself, which means be independent. And I also add to that, do your due diligence. You know, I find it unnecessary and offensive to do a blanket veto of everything. I can understand in doing my due diligence the pros and cons of some of these things and looking into the reasoning as to why the mayor vetoed some. But at the end of the day, some are, are no-brainers. And I'll get into the substance as we take um, each one one by one. But, you know, we're not hurting anybody. And uh, at the end of the day, it goes back to things that my mother tells me and things that I heard today. Vote for what you think is right and be independent. And that's it. So thank you. And I look forward to uh, making our decisions here. Am I recognized, sir? And he, yes, you are. That's why I'm looking at you, yes, sir. Councilman Gooch, you're recognized. It's a travesty how these four years have gone up and down and sometimes very aggressive. Mm. I've always been a person of the ball coach that I can agree to disagree and I'm not going to retaliate, I'm not going to be angry at anybody. That's, you made that decision. I've always been a compromiser. And there have been several issues in this council that I should have went with what the constituents said, but I went with the administration. I've done that. I gathered all the council members together to go across the street. Many of you said, I don't want to go there. But because I was a chairman, you believed in me, you, you went. You told me, I'm going to go because it's you, even though you didn't vote for certain things. I'm appreciative of that because I wanted us to be a body of together people. I believe that I'm never going to disrespect any other council members, no matter what. If I have a problem, I'm going to come to you. I'm not going to go over to the ministry. I'm not going to do something. I'm going to come to you. That's why I believe in how to handle business. Say that with the administration. You got a problem, you come to the council members. You work it out then. You don't try to sabotage and do things that, that I believe are unethical. You know, we all had our meeting with the mayor, and we all probably said what we had to say to the mayor. That's the things I said, and, you know, uh, don't even wish I took them back because I was truthful at the time. I was angry, but I didn't, I didn't go in a certain area I wanted to go. Because my faith led me to say, no, you stop yourself. You said enough. I do respect the administration, but sometimes I don't respect their tactics. I will always work with the administration. I, if I'm here tomorrow, going tomorrow, I'm still going to be the same person. I'm going to say what I have to say. That's why I'm an outspoken person. I'm not the angry black man. I'm just a man who's passionate, who's seen things in this city that have been wrong, and for communities that have been wronged. What I see in this city, is just, it's just about power and money at times. Power and money. And money is the root of all evil, as we all know. I don't like a strong form of mayoral government because it's a dictatorship at times. I truly believe that because they're run by power and money. But when you have a collegial body who can hear the people, because I feel we hear the people. We had some constituents out there say, you can't just talk to the mayor, get appointed with the mayor. It doesn't work that way. But here, we're on ground zero. People come here. We walk out. It's a different process. Yes, it's good to have an executive who can run the city and do those things we can't do. That's great. But I believe money and power gets infected when you have somebody who, 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 who has control. We have no control over employees. We have no control of this and that. We have control to legislate this community, the city, make sure things are done aboard and properly. And when citizens come here every Thursday and make their complaints, it's our job to hear their complaints and ask questions and get it right to the best we can. I'm always going to do that. I'm always going to listen to the people. And if there's something I don't agree with, I'm going to go to the people and say, well, I can't support that. I'm going to tell you why I can't support it. I'm going to be up front with them. I'm different with developers. They come to me and say, hey, I'm going to tell you this. 
You need to do this, this, and that. I can't support that. I don't, I'm not a guy to sit online and wave, well, you know, and you know me think. I don't do that. I ain't think about that. I can tell you right now how I feel. I don't need to waver with anybody. If I don't like someone, I'm gonna tell you. We don't need to keep having a debate. The mayor's already vetoed it. I don't know what the discussion is. My thing is, let's go take the vote. The public has already spoken. You know, it, it is what it is at this point. And then to come in and talk about an ordinance, I mean, hell, how many times we ask about an ordinance and all that? And we got all kind of if, ands, and buts. We went over this thing about two years about getting it already done way before this even came about. This stuff could have been done. But we played and we kicked it down the field. Let's wait and play these kind of games. Then Mr. Shelby was gone on a sabbatical, you know. Had, went, 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 went out of the city to turn to give any guidance or anything. Still haven't, haven't come to the, the premise of we do need a second person with Mr. Shelby. Still, we have an opportunity to be able to get more staff. We didn't do that. And you know we need more staff. You know we need more staff. Yep. The money situation. We needed the money. Cost of living, everything. The public said they told us what they wanted. We work for them. We don't work for ourselves. This has been a downfall sometimes with this council that we're not listening to the people on real issues. Right. This charter, we know if I had the power, it needs to be looked at again because there are things that are wrong in it. Interpretations. We have members who sit on the board. And we know, that's why we're raising hell saying we didn't know, but we know now there are things that need to be changed. I yield back, sir. Councilman Moran, did I see your hand up? No, sir, I'm waiting for Thank the rest. Councilman, Councilman Moran, her tag. Hi, um, and I appreciate all of my colleagues' comments. Uh, you know, we do have a strong mayor form of government. And it may not be in the charter itself, but because of how the administration works, how the charter has laid out how the city runs, there is someone who runs the day-to-day -day operation. But our job as city council is to make the laws and we are at checks and balances on how all that works. We look at the cost of things every week. We look at changing uh, land use zoning. Our job is to set the path for the administration to follow. That is what we're supposed to do. That's what the balance of power is. So yes, there's a strong mayor form of government, but the city council is supposed to act as a check and balances system. And to be honest, a lot of the times we haven't done that. This body has sat as a rubber stamp for many, many, many years. This particular council has decided they don't want to do that anymore. So, so while there may be disagreement, there, there's not a fight. All it is is now we have a culture where we're disagreeing sometimes. We're just disagreeing. I mean, I always tell people, like, I chose my husband. Like, I love that man, but there is no way. I don't agree with him on everything, so how in the world can I agree with anyone else? And that's the way I feel. We did sit down, we did talk about these, and uh, the mayor asked me if I had any problems with them. I said no. Was I concerned that the public didn't have enough time? I said no. We had at least four different meetings where we were able to talk about this. And over and over again, the public said they wanted to have uh, a word in this. They wanted to vote. So my thing, I, I'm not gonna approve any type of just ordinance or resolution to get it done because what we're hearing, what I'm hearing now is that the people want this done. They want to vote on it. Um, there's nothing special about overriding a veto. It's just one of the other things that we can do as council. I'm proud of being a member of this body who really is studying and looking at how this city runs every day. And this city has gone from slightly complicated to vastly complicated in two years' time. And I know that we all work our... I hope that we all work our hardest to, to find that balance. But here's the thing. This is our job. We were elected or appointed to do this job, to look at each thing and decide whether or not it fits with where our city needs to go. And the public is telling us they want input on how our city runs. Uh, especially when it comes to, um, I'm going to single out one of them, the interim department heads. The public saying what happened, what, nine months ago, 
can't happen again. That's right. And that's what this does. We're closing a loophole so it doesn't happen again. So all of these are slight changes that are going to make our city's charter better. Or not, depending upon what y'all say. But it's not our choice. It's going to be up to you. Thank you. Council, thank you for indulging me, and I thank you for this robust discussion. Ms. Zellman, before you walk away, thank you for giving me your opinion on whether or not these can be done through ordinance or resolutions. Now, let's just take one second. If we were to set an ordinance or a resolution into motion today, it would probably take two weeks for it to come back. Then we would have a first reading, which is another week. That's first reading is another week. Then we would have to have second reading, which is another two weeks. So now we're up to six weeks. Well, you had an extra week in there. If, if we were able, for instance, the CRB um, attorney is an example of one where even the outside counsel that you had work on these ordinances advised you that role could be created by a code amendment. You already have a code that was adopted by the city council in 2021 that spells out how legal advice, legal counsel is provided to the CRB. So if you want to change the way legal counsel is provided to the CRB, the simplest and easiest and most logical way of doing that, frankly, would be to amend that code. So if we were to bring you an ordinance, you would hear it on first reading, two weeks later, second reading and adoption. The ex extra weeks may fall in there because of the sire deadlines and the schedule for your hearings. But yes, that's something, that's a perfect example of something that could be done very quickly. And, and while I have the podium, I, got you, I, got you. I, I just want to make I got you. two two historical corrections or additions to what was said. Councilman Miranda, in 1990, um, Mayor Sandy Freeman actually vetoed two proposed charter amendments uh, regarding a charter review commission. And interestingly, when I read her letter and read the mayor's letter, they, they were saying some of the same objections, that this was rushed, it wasn't well thought out, and I'm happy to work with the council on a solution. I, just, just for historical reference, since you mentioned that. And then I just, I do want to correct one thing that I think was unfair, um, only because I was so involved with this. The delay, the, the timing of the charter review workshop that you all had, there was not a single delay caused by the administration. I charted out every single motion that was made starting in February of 2021 when Councilman Dingfelder first motion for a workshop on the Charter Amendment. Every delay, with the exception of one, when a facilitator's husband had COVID, was either council uh, voting to reschedule it, voting to reschedule it in order to hire a facilitator. In September, you actually opened a charter workshop and then closed it and continued it to November. None of that was the administration trying to delay this, so I, I just, I think that's unfair, and I wanted to correct that. And now I've forgotten what the question was. You asked me. I apologize. And, uh, uh, timeline. Code, if we did this, if we took the action today, will, could a code or an ordinance be put into effect before the elections? I believe so, yes. Thank you. I'm going to go to Councilman Goods, and then I'll go to Councilman Miranda. Mr. Chairman, with all, with all due respect, I, I thought we were here today right. to vote right. on the right. proposed charters. I didn't know we were here to discuss another avenue. I don't think any of the council members here to discuss another avenue. I, I thought, with all due respect, that we were here to get this done, to, to either override or not with a vote and continue, but not go to legal council to ask about all these different avenues and ways. We've already discussed if, those things. If I can let me finish, sir. Let me, let me finish, sir. We've already already asked those questions and got run around questions in reference to ordinance and all these type of things. That's why we're here today. So I, I would ask, Mr. Chairman, that a vote be put on the floor from, for all five items and we move forward and let's just stop the, the, the bureaucracy BS and let's move. Councilman Miranda. Thank you. I have no, no uh, 
the Honorable City Attorney at Renfrew's 1990, and when I spoke, I clearly said that from 74 to 79 I was here, and I didn't come back to 1995, <laughs> and uh, evidently she found something in 1990 that I was not aware of because I was not here. Right. So everything that I said was correct, and everything that she said was correct, so two correction doesn't equal a minus. Right. However, it's, again, if uh, what we want to do is make some changes, and I believe one of the changes here, I don't recall all of because there was 20-something that was presented. I think one of them has the idea that we are going to ask approval. There's got to be approval from us, whoever wants to hire one, one department head. I'm, sure, I'm not sure about it if I remember that that way, that the, instead of working for the mayor, whoever the mayor is, that department head has to be approved by the council first before the mayor or something like that. Yeah, that, that really should go the change of the government. When you start changing the structure of a government, you have to get approved by the citizens. This, they should have it all and take it all that you want to change the way we have a government. I have no, no, no problem with that. But when you start doing these things, in my mind, it's not the right thing to do. I'm just me. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Councilwoman Hurtak. We've tried the ordinance and resolution uh, thing before, and it keeps getting shot down. And that's why the voters have wanted us to go to um, go to a vote. Because here's the thing: we we just we're going we're going to just keep going round and round and round. And people are going to change their votes. And so here, I mean, we all already approved these unanimously just a couple weeks ago. So I'm let let's just as as uh, Councilman Good said. Let's just get these votes done and let the people know whether or not you are going to support them making the decision. Uh, again, I thank you all. To, to a couple of council people's point, I'm not here to be right. I just want to be heard. And so even though we are, even though there is going to be a change today, whether or not we override the mayor or whether or not we set into motion a code or an ordinance. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the only time we can have discussions. All I wanted to be was heard. We have options. We are the legislative body of this city. Thank you, Council Met. Councilman Carlson. Sorry, I, ha I have to ask, and this will sound disrespectful, but considering the text messages we've seen and the, and the behind the scenes shenanigans, um, I have to ask, uh, Mr. Chair, did the mayor or her staff ask you to throw wow. this monkey wrench into, wow. the, into the engine today, or did they coach you on, on saying it? Because these are the kinds of shenanigans they've been pulling for two years, which obviously Ms. Zellman is not aware of. Um, she talked about the legal process, but she's not made, probably not aware of the, the dirty politics that have gone on behind the scenes. And while I still have the floor, the chief of staff will confirm that I told the mayor directly, I said, I said, you know, if your staff who are paid by the city and supposed to be representing the city, if they are pushing negative messages and negative stories about city council, trying to stir up fights between city council members, that's despicable. It's not only unethical, it's illegal. You cannot do that. Please tell them to stop. And I said, if my legislative aide was doing the same thing, I would fire her. But this mayor allows these people, these staff members being paid by taxpayers who we approve to attack city council, attack the public. It's despicable. We need to end this. The fighting needs to end. The public wants peace. And if, and if she's put up another city council member to attack us again today and throw a wrench into this, it's really terrible. Councilman Miranda. Uh, let me clear one thing. It was said that a mayor met with all the council members. I have to disagree with that. See, I had an appointment with the mayor. They wanted me to meet with her at 8.30 in the morning last Friday, and I could not keep that appointment because I have another responsibility. So I said, we'll meet at 8 o'clock. I came here about a quarter to 7, did my work upstairs, came back down. I yeah. waited to 8.23, and I left because I have to be in Osmar <laughs> by 9.00. So I never met with the mayor. So I want to let that clear that the mayor and I never met, sat down, and had a debate like Mr. Carlson said he did. But let me tell you about me. I don't believe the way I was raised 
that I do things for myself. I do, and when I vote, it's not for me, not for the benefit of me, but what I think is the best for the public. And if we want to make changes, we should make changes and let the public vote on all of them by a charter change. Let them vote what kind of government they want, strong form of government or not. The problem here is lack of communications and lack of understanding what you got elected for. Legislative and memorial. That's it. Thank you very much. In answer to your question, Council Carlson, Councilman Carlson. Yes or no? No. And if you wish to make a public records request for my cell phone or my computers, I beg you, please do it. Please do it. I'm not insulted by that question. That is a fair and honest question. But again, if you would like to make pub public records request, I'm not afraid of it. I've been subpoenaed before with other things that happened earlier in this council. So I, please. I assume you're telling the truth, and I, I'm glad that Don't that assume. Is, Take it as truth. I, I, I am glad that you said that, and um, I hope that doesn't happen by the administration again. Thank you, Councilman Carlson. All right. What's the pleasure of Councilman? I'm Aye. sorry. Did, did um, Chief Bennett? Good morning, Council. Good morning. Actually, yep, we're still good morning. Good morning, Council. Good morning, public. John Bennett, Chief of Staff. I think from our perspective in watching the the first reading, second reading, and now here we are um, after the mayor's veto memo came in by process to council. Um, first of all, on the record, the mayor is traveling, trying to bring resources to Tampa through the federal government in Washington, D.C. So that's where she's at. Her staff is here representing her, including myself, the city attorney, for her role with the, with the mayor's office. And of course, we have executive staff members here to answer any questions for any of the itemized, either the vetoes or the process surrounding supporting and implementing any of the uh, recommended ordinances to go forward to the public. Um, so as far as the request from the administration, there's been some philosophical talk over some time now. And then we also would like to engage council before each vote from the administration. So it's just a request to council to be able to have a global discussion about how the vetoes came about as far as <clears throat> the process goes to explain the position of the administration and then before each vote on each of the uh, recommended ordinances to go to the public we would like to just give some feedback i do feel that you know from my perspective i've tried to be an active listener to council the public and of course our staff for three and a half years and and try and bring all that collaboration together. And, and that's, you know, again, in a big city, as Councilwoman Hurtak said, it is getting more dynamic every day. And our accountability is getting higher every day. And it does take a lot of accountability to make sure that we work together to get things done. So if Council will indulge me, I'd like to talk for a few minutes about, um, and I understand we're trying to hustle to a vote, but the difference between hustling is to for an outcome. The difference for perseverance is the process. And I think we're trying to persevere around a process. So I would ask that the administration be allowed to give the feedback that we've only had very limited ability to do during this process. I think one time, one council member asked one staff member to come to the podium and give feedback. Otherwise, council made us understand that this was their process and we respected that journey. But now that the veto package is in, I feel like we have an obligation to the public to explain why that was done. And the mayor is the epitome of democracy with her staff. She listens to every single administrator, director about implementing and operating their de specific departments before she makes a decision. And so all of that needs to be conveyed to the public, in my humble opinion. Thank you. Councilman Goods. Good morning, Chief. What, you know, with all due respect, you, you know the conversation we had over there on Friday. Be it pleasant or not, we, we said we had to say. What today you're representing the mayor because you said the mayor is out of town Correct. trying to bring money to the city, which is great. But the problem is I have is I don't again what Mr. Carlos is talking about. Why are we bringing city staff to come to talk to council about charter amendments? I don't understand that process. Now, if you represent the mayor and you have the pinpoints from the mayor, but I have an issue with department heads or other city staff coming before this council 
about these charter amendments. They don't have a, a fight in the game on those things. Right. The mayor vetoed them because however she felt she needed to veto them, she might have met with her, met with you and her staff. But I, I do have an issue with other department heads coming to this podium speaking on these issues. I feel I, I, I respect the process. I think the process, if you're here today to, to represent the mayor, I, we will hear from you. I have no problem with that. But I, I, other councilors can, can chime in or not. But I have an issue for staff being involved in this process this time. Thank you. Can I reply to each one, Chairman? To each council member? Well, if I'm being asked a question, I'd like to be able to reply in real time. Please. So with all due respect to that feedback, which I appreciate, staff has to implement everything that council adopts and the importance of implementation. And I, can, I will be able to give examples in each one of those charter recommendation for amendments to the charter of how they could be or be challenged to implement. So that's where staff comes in. They need to hear that in real time. And, and we try to respect listening to the public, listening to council to make sure that we can optimize our implementation to do it the best way possible. So however this ends up, we have to implement. All 4,800 employees have to live and breathe that implementation. So it's very important that they hear things in that great detail to make sure we serve the community the way we collectively work together. Councilman Hurtak. Um, I'm going to say that I don't necessarily think it's appropriate because you've had four other chances to do so. Um, and I mean, you, you've had chances, and you can talk to us anytime. This is the first time hearing of this. And so I, I'm just not okay with it. You could have come with it to us. I mean, you're just, at this point, we're just trying to drag it out. Right. And after we agree or disagree to put these on the ballot, you are, I think staff is welcome to go to the public. But the mayor had an opportunity during her letter, and she didn't, at least she didn't contact me personally to let me know about it. Uh, we, had, we sat down for a meeting. She didn't tell me the particulars for each one. We had that opportunity. She didn't at all tell me that there might be some problems with putting these, uh, 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 implementing them. And I honestly don't see how implementing the fact that uh, this city council has uh, term limits is a problem. That, that's not going to affect you all. Uh, so I'm, I, I'm sorry, but I mean, I, I don't see a need. At this point, we're just here to override vetoes. That's right. That's right. Councilman Carlson. Yeah. You often get, get up here and, and talk to us individually and talk about how you're the peacemaker, you're the go-between, everything. Mm -hmm. In your consensus building experience, do you think it builds trust for the elected body, legislative body of the city of, of Tampa to learn about the mayor's veto through a Google alert right. um, or, or through reading the op-ed um, directly? Do you think that's a respectful way to build trust? So I think if you look at it from a timing continuum, it was really the only way possible. I mean, the veto could have been all the way done to today, I think, at noon, if you look at a time clock. But why wouldn't you have sent the memo the night before? It's, it's, it's obviously, this is what I said, the administration looks through the political lens rather than looking at building trust or, or looking at good policy. Somebody in the mayor's office, I can guarantee, said, you know, we're, we got to blindside them because because otherwise they'll have a chance to respond with an op-ed or a guest editorial. That's what happened. This is if it was if it was about building trust, they would somebody would have called us. The mayor would have called us directly. And by the way, when I met with the mayor, and you'll get you'll verify this, I said I think you should meet with every city council member every month. And when you have when you disagree about something, uh, you should not only call the pe the votes you're trying to get, call the people who disagree with you and say, you know what. You and I are going to disagree on that, can be, can, but can we do it civilly? Instead, there are these attacks. Do you think, my second question, do you think it's right and a good use of, of city resources for the mayor's staff to constantly attack city council members who disagree with them? And I, I'll answer that one first, and I'll go back to the other one. The first one, the mayor, because I was there, agreed with you that it is not appropriate to do that, and she has held people accountable for that. That's the first answer. The second answer to the first question was that if you look at the continuum, two weeks ago, council voted to put these where they are now. The mayor respected that process. We have always encouraged our staff to start with help me understand. The mayor did that by inviting everybody into her office, which from my experience in three and a half years, every invitation has come from the mayor's office 
to meet with anybody for any reason. So they all germinated from that. But her goal was to help her understand behind each one of your intentions on a huge responsibility to change the city charter to make sure that she understand before she put any decision together that she heard from each one of you individually. I sat in every one of those meetings and I never heard her once try and change somebody's opinion but only understand where this is coming from. And that was really the goal of it. Now, again, it's an opportunity to share ideas, express differences, challenge each other. That's all good work. And that's going to really be part, if I can get to do that presentation, part of this is what we should be doing is celebrating how much great we did over the last three and a half years when three statistically valid surveys have been done in this city that says council and the mayor and the public have a 90% approval rating three years in a row compared to the national average. That's an amazing job. That's an amazing job. Council should be happy about that. The administration should be happy about that and the public should be happy about that. We've got to celebrate the work that we've done together and we have taken many things back from council and brought them back at the request of council to refine and improve the outcomes. And the last thing I'll say at this moment is that there are so many ways to make change. You know, I've raised four children and I've coached hundreds of kids in youth sports just like Councilman Goods has. You change behavior at the lowest denominator possible until that doesn't work. And there is a complete list of things that can be done on these five amendments that don't require a charter change. And that is the difference. That's the difference when you change things iteratively as opposed to so, going to the highest level. So this obviously this. is the latest the latest tactic the administration is using. And, and despite what Ms. Zellman said, there were a lot of political tactics that were used against us. Remember one day we, there were 20 uh, police officers sitting in the audience that were paid by taxpayers for four or five hours to intimidate us. And, and uh, the administration, remember the time the administration brought um, people from East Tampa to, to say they were in favor of uh, renting while black and then gave them rides back and forth. I mean, these are dirty tactics that have been used. I, I, we should not waste the time of the members of the public and not waste our time today. The new excuse today is, oh, well, uh, you didn't ask enough staff members to come up and give their opinion. But right. I will say in response, every week the administration has a chance to do an administrative update. And at least three or four weeks in the last few months, the administration has done no update. Right. So the administration had an opinion. They could have called us. They could have met with us. They could have given whatever you're going to say today. The administration could have said that before. I, I think we need to call the question and vote on these. Second. One final thought, and then I'll return it back to the chairman and council, is that you learn as you go. Everything is iterative. So when the mayor got your feedback is when she put the veto package together to bring it to council. That was an iterative process of listening to the entire journey, plus listening to each of you, and then, of course, the public as well, to make that decision to veto each one of these. Now, each one of them has a prescriptive reason towards that, which I'm, I'm hoping that we can come up. So the point in time that we were able to do that was after the last meeting with the last council member, which was on this Tuesday. So that's the timeline. That is not an end around or a trick or anything else. That's a process. Can I just, 20 more seconds to fit it. Just we have a motion made by Councilman Carlson to proceed with the voting, seconded by Councilwoman Hurtak. All in favor? Comment on the motion. I will ask, I, uh, excuse me, any Further comment yeah, on that motion? Yes. I do have, the question is, the question is whether to call the question, that was the motion, to call the question. I believe that was made by Councilman, Councilman Carlson, Carlson. seconded by Councilman Hurtak. And the question on the floor is to what? And the debate, because I want to be clear, and excuse me and pardon me and bear with me for trying to make sure this process goes as accordingly per the charter. It was my understanding that what council was going to do was going to take each ordinance individually and allow for presentation and allow for the public to speak as part of what the charter refers to as reconsideration. That was the way it was meant to be. Now, by calling the question, the question is what is on the floor? There, the is, floor, no, it, there, there is no other motion or action the on the floor. The motion on the floor, correct me if I'm wrong, Council Carl, Councilman Carlson, is to end the discussion and, and go, go for a vote on these. Yes. Go, 
on overriding these. Is, is that your motion? Yes, which of course would include public comment. Yes. And, that, and that is what I have perceived, and that's why I am asking for a call on this motion made by Councilman Carlson to end the debate, seconded by Carl, uh, Councilwoman Hurtak. Is there any discussion? Councilman Vieira. It, it's funny because I was going to do a call to the a call the question for a number of reasons, including to end council speaking on it, um, as well as administration. But what I was going to suggest is, is that Mr. Bennett wanted to have, I, I, I think, three minutes for each one. Why don't we call the question, two minutes for him, and then we vote. And that's it. And, and no more council discussion, it's just to be reasonable and just go gotcha. forward and vote. I, I've already stated, by the way, how I'm going to vote. And, and, but this is about being reasonable. Let's do that. that that's, that's what I was going to motion for. So it's about 90% of what Councilman Carlson said with a little something extra. Thank you. Councilman Hurtak. Um, I, I like that, but I would like to amend that to say that everybody gets just one minute. Sure. Public and, and staff. All right. All right. Yeah. Does that work? That, I, I accept the amendment. Well, okay. I accept my second. Anything you want to say, Mr. Shelby? Make it brief. No, it, let's find out what the pleasure of counsel is. All in favor is. say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Motion passed. Now, now, Mr. Chairman, my understanding is that each item is going to be taken up, each ordinance is going to be taken up individually. Is that correct? That is, that is correct. That was the plan. So we are going to hear from number... E2022-8, Chapter 2. Wait, let's do it by ordinance number. Let's do it. I'm I don't sorry, ordinance number, ordinance number 2023-1. I'll read it. Go ahead. Um, this is an, uh, and I, I'm saying we're, we're moving the ordinance, correct, Mr. Shelby? I'm about to read it. <coughs> overriding the mayor's So veto. I'm, we're overriding the mayor's veto in an ordinance relating to the government of the city of Tampa, Florida, submitting to the electors of the city a proposed amendment to the revised charter of the city of Tampa of 1975 as amended to amend section 9.01 to clarify that standing boards shall be created by city council by ordinance without requiring the mayor's recommendation, providing an effective date. We have a motion made. Made by Councilman Hurtak, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. Any discussion? Councilman Maniscalco. Yes, so I'm going to support overriding this uh, because in 2015, the issue came up with the creation of the CRB and who had the authority to create boards. And uh, back then, it was a discussion be between the administration and the council of who had the authority. I always believe since 2015 that city council had the authority to create boards, and this came into what we voted on. Uh, creating the CRB. I think this is a no-brainer. Uh, I see uh, the mayor's rebuttal and some sig uh, suggestions that she had against this regarding financial and logistical impact on the city, but as a city council, we would vote in the budget to allocate funds, and we would vote on that, in order to support those boards or not support those boards. So it is a process in which we would be acting responsibly, and again, I believe what I believed in 2015 when we created the board, and I support that today. So that is my second and my explanation as to why. Councilman Miranda. I have a one and no brainer, I guess that's what I would call it. Uh, let me just say this, that it is incumbent of us to follow the process. In 2015, the process was what? We had a board of people from the community who we put in between the administration and this legislative body, the city council. That board met for many, many months. That board spent many, many meetings to bring to the council members at that time what their recommendations were to change the charter. That was passed by the city council unanimously. So therefore, this is a fraud process, in my opinion, from a no-brainer, that's what I was called. So I want to say thank you very much for calling me a no-brainer. At least I have a name and I know who I am. Thank you very much. <laughs> Councilman Carlson. Yeah, I've said this in every discussion we have about it, but the process since 1974, uh, when the charter was made, was that the city council can vote to put uh, an, uh, something on the ballot to allow the public to vote on it. Uh, the new process that was put in place in 2015 was uh, not written about in the charter. It was something that the city council, of which three members are here, put together a charter review commission. Four of us were on there, plus two of the attorneys in the room were on that uh, charter review commission. 
We happen to have specialized expertise because of that, and now we have the benefit of having worked in the city. And um, we've had not just the formal discussions, but months and months and months of discussion about these topics, and more that were all shot down. Um, the um, the, the, uh, the Charter, um, the charter uh, Review Commission added a, um, a, a, a proposal to the public to vote to add the Charter Review Commission, and it was added. And so um, we're following the original process, not the, um, not the new process. But it's not that the process wasn't followed. It's just a different process. Mr. Mr. Chair, if I may. One minute, right? One, one, I'll talk one more. minute. I, I'm just, I want to clarify something. You're confusing two issues. The issue in 2015 was the creation of the Citizens Review Board for the police. And it wasn't the question of whether the mayor versus the council could create a board. It was whether the council had the authority to create a board that would arguably regulate the police department, which the then mayor argued was clearly within his purview. So the it was the subject matter of the board that was the controversy then, not the question about the creation of the board. And some of you are confusing that with the creation of the Charter Review Commission, which was a separate issue. So I just wanted to clarify that. Chief, you have one minute? I do. So I think what's important about our minute, if you don't mind bringing up the Elmo. It's there. All right, thank you. Um, I know the public saw the news, but they may have not read the memo from the mayor in detail. So this is lifted from the memo. So I just highlighted for the sake of time, because I knew council would be interested in, in uh, the agenda timing today. But her following objections, significant, significant and financial logistical impact, again, the staff wanted to help council and the public understand that these things cost time, money, resources. We want to make sure that we're included in supporting the decision, which is why the balance of power existed from the beginning. If the mayor creates a board, council has to approve. If council creates a board, the mayor approves. So we could weigh in on supporting that board. The citizens uh, budget advisory council is a good example on how challenging it is to make sure all that's done. Not to mention, maybe we should have spent time surveying all of our board members to make sure that we had good data to understand their challenges of being a board member. Opposite of checks and balances, I mentioned, inconsistent with another section of the charter and amended already in 2019. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there anyone in council chambers that wishes to comment to this motion? You have one minute. That's interesting how you change the timing of people, but irrespective of that, you know what we've seen right here for the last two and a half hours is a demonstration of when you a child or you're a minor and you do something wrong and you're like apprehensive about going home or facing your parents and you delay because you know you're in trouble. Or when you have unprotected sex and you feel it burning down there and you delay going to the doctor <laughs> because you know you're in trouble. You don't want them to tell you you have herpes or AIDS or something <laughs> devastating. And that's what all of y'all are doing. The mayor staff and the city council, you're having a lot of delays to do a straight up and down vote. And that's why you're, once again, like expending taxpayers' time and your time unnecessarily. What happened here is the mayor trying for a power grab, and you guys just have to block it, plain and simple. All the discussion probably wasn't necessary. Good morning, my name is Stephanie Corner. Um, I think that city council should be able to create its own committees. I'm on a committee that doesn't have a mayoral um, candidate, and I think it works just fine. So I don't really understand why we have to have permission to create a committee. Um, we have staff who creates committees, so why can't city council do it without somebody holding their hand? I would like to point out that in the, dis in the quashed period that city council did this for two years this morning um, the mayor released this her vetoes 24 hours ago to the public that's why this room is not packed out we met with two candidates yesterday that didn't even know about it when we talked to them so nobody knows or they would be here thank you Rick Pfeiffer 11 East Tana um, yes, I'm running for one of these seats up there. I've been listening to this, and I think I'm not an attorney, 
but I've been trying to read the charter because if I want to run for something, I need to know what the requirements are. It seems like the changes that are being proposed are relatively simple. I see, a, I hear a lot of drama over strong, strong mayor and you're weakening it. I'm looking at this and I'm saying these are minor tweaks. I do think that if we truly actually believe in democracy, we're going to let the people vote on what their government structure is like. I don't think anything that's been proposed that you guys voted by veto-proof majorities, because I've been watching, um, I don't think any of them are unreasonable. And I thought you were only going to have one minute for everything, so that's why I did this. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers who wish to speak to this? In uh, 30 seconds, based on what I hear and know how legalities go, I, I respectfully request that uh, if any information that the city was going to present, that it be received and filed in the record, whether he presents it or not, so that I can have a chance to look at what he was going to present. So if he's got some documents, and I'm going to say this five times, that each of those documents would be put in the record because I'm probably going to be the one to do anything legal or otherwise. So please have what he has into the record if he presents it or not. That's my request. And that'll be each time I come up, just so that I have a written record of what they was going to say, plus what everybody else is saying. And I request that to be done. Then move to receive and file any documents that would be presented for all five of these uh, ordinances in question. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilwoman Hurtak. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Thank you. Anyone else in chambers? Councilman Vieira. Yeah, for one minute, just very quick, again, like uh, the former, the gentleman said to me, this is something that's very reasonable. Uh, and Mr. Shelby, quick question, when the uh, council does create a board under this, the mayor then has the chance to veto it, correct? If it is created, if it is created by ordinance, ordinance. obviously per the charter, mm -hmm. just as the process you're going through now, it would have to be presented to the mayor for uh, either her signature or her rejection and returning it veto. So the answer to that question is, um, when you create an ordinance, just as you did with the <clears throat> CRB, it was created and sent to the mayor for the mayor's signature. Thank you, sir. Nothing further. Thank you. Place your votes and record. The yes to override, correct? Yes. Motion carried with Miranda voting no. Make, make the motion. No, 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 just make the motion to take a two minute break. I, no, I, I used to use the restroom. And that's <laughs> 30 seconds. Motion made by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Mascock. All in favor? Aye. <laughs>
Carlson. Here. Vieira. Here. Maniscalco. Here. Hertek. Here. Goose. Here. Miranda. And Citro. Here. We have a physical form. Mr. Chairman. For the Yes, for the purposes of the record, just so that we're all clear, we're, we're back in session and back on the record, and it is now 12.05. I just want to know what Council's pleasure is uh, proceeding forward. The consent. Oh, I'm sorry. Go right ahead. Do you want to say it? No, no. Uh, the consensus of Council is that we will get through these charter amendments uh, of overriding the mayor or not before we go to lunch. Yeah. So there's not going to be a hard stop. If, if it takes <coughs> after 12.30 or till 1 o'clock, that's fine. And that's the consensus of council by unanimous consent. That, that is yes. correct. Thank you, sir. Uh, Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, I move uh, to override uh, an, um, the mayor's veto of an ordinance relating to, um, uh, ordinance number 2023-2, an ordinance relating to the government of the city of Tampa, Florida, submitting to the electors of the city a proposed amendment to the revised charter of the city of Tampa of 1975 as amended to clarify that the mayor's nominations for heads of departments and other city employees as set out in section 6.03 must be approved by four votes of the city council and to provide for interim appointments of existing city employees by the mayor for a maximum of 180 days providing an effective date. Mr. Myers, why are you doing this? There's a motion made by Councilwoman Hertak, seconded by Councilman Carlson. Any further discussion? Councilman Mascalco. Okay, and looking at this one regarding the appointments, I looked at two uh, recent events. First, the police chief situation, which I think spurred this entire uh, discussion. And second, when we appointed or selected a uh, CRA director that did not take the job. Uh, those were both very public. The CRA director was a public discussion where the public came to meet the people and everything, and it was made known to his existing or previous employer that that person had intentions to leave. Um, that person was selected, but did not take the job. Um, so that was that. It was a very public process. The person did not take the job. I don't know what his situation is now. That's one thing. The second thing is, uh, and what happened, what, in December, we approved a police chief that was appointed by the mayor without choice of picking one person or another. The mayor chose the person, we vote that person up or down, and that mayor, if we had voted that person down, sorry, um, they, would, uh, they would have been in an interim position and stayed there, whatever. My thing is here, and I'll wrap it up quickly and I apologize, the mayor has the responsibility to supervise, manage, and the power to remove or terminate department heads and senior administration, administrators. In the situation with the police chief, I think the mayor acted swiftly, asked for the letter of resignation, and that person was terminated. So because of that, I think the, as it is, as it, as it is now, I think it works. So I don't want to change it. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, that is not what this is saying. What, right. what this is saying is that basically the interim uh, a, uh, department head has to be a city employee. That's what it's saying. So that was the problem with the, with the police chief vote. And I was not on this council during that time. I was a citizen who was upset about that vote because I didn't feel like we got, um, as, as a citizen, we got any real input there. Um, so what happened was, from my understanding, the mayor appointed someone from not in the city as an interim director and then just said, oh, by the way, we're just gonna start calling her the police chief. We're not gonna use the interim title, which we're using right now for interim chief Bearcaw, and, uh, and we're using that title interim. Um, and that she just started that very day without approval from council. But that's the kind of thing that if we decided, no, we didn't want her, she would have to now then leave the position and she had gone through all this HR when she really hadn't, didn't have the right to do that. And that's what this is, this is closing that loophole about interim appointments. Councilman Miranda. I appreciate everything's being said uh, regarding this, but I look at this in a, in a normal way, in my normal way anyway, the, the life that I live, is that you certainly are responsible for your children, but you're not going to go to jail for something that your children do. Meaning that no matter who the mayor is, that mayor makes an appointment of someone that mayor is not responsible what that person does somewhere else, not disregarding the position that he or she has in the city. In this case, 
The mayor's not the one that showed the badge. The mayor's not the one that spoke out. It was the appointee that spoke that, and that appointee was swiftly removed. <clears throat> so the character of life is, it's that the mayor wasn't the one that was charged. It was the appointee that was charged, and the appointee is no longer here. That's all. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, and uh, for all of these and all the ones we talked about before, the idea of taking away power from the strong mayor, former government, came up. And that's not at all true in this case. It always has been true that the mayor nominates somebody and city council approves. Um, we clarified a little bit in the last charter changes in the use of the word interim, but it's always been true that the mayor cannot appoint some uh, uh, department head without city council approval. We're not changing that. We're not adding that now. That's already been true for a long time. If if city council doesn't like the uh, the nominee, we could, we've always been able to vote no. All this does is it, it, it prevents the problem that some of the staff mentioned. What happens if a mayor brings in somebody for outside uh, saying, wink and a nod, you're going to get the job, don't worry, I'm going to get your, and that person's given up their job in another place, they've partly relocated their family, and then they come before city council and city council says no. All that does is that keeps, it, it really protects the applicant more than anything. It doesn't take power away from the mayor, because otherwise it's a strong arm tactic like we experienced in December. We need to, we need to just clarify this so we don't have problems in the future. Thank you. Chief Bennett. Again, good afternoon, John Bennett, Chief of Staff. Again, I'm lifting from the language of the mayor's memo in her stead right now. Um, you know, it is about the process. This is changing the form of government by council essentially appointing a department head or an administrator to report then to the mayor after the fact. It is, it is different than what has been going on. This is one of those things that we had talked about over the time when I got here about improving the process if there is a misinterpretation of the current charter by doing a resolution. So we feel like a resolution of how we engage this process until such time we need to do it further in a process would be beneficial. This is one of the biggest things that changes the form of government for the city. And I just want to add one thing. It's not accurate to say that the only thing it changes is the interim appointment. Um, the Charter Review Commission discussed at length, recommended, the voters approved, adding language to 6.03, saying that if the mayor submitted a name, was voted down, she would have the ability to resubmit that name. Now you're taking that away. So that's changing something that was just changed. I, I think that it's important to make that clear. And I also can't agree that changing appointment and confirmation to nominee and appointing is no change. If it is, why do it? But the fact is, you are changing it. You're, you're putting the mayor in the position of being the nominator and the council in the position of appointing department heads rather than the mayor doing it. Councilman Maniscalco. How many times can the mayor resubmit a name? Is there a limit or can it just be in perpetuity forever and ever? Keep resubmitting after being voted down. Let's quote the charter. It says, in the event of disapproval by the city council of any said appointments, the mayor within 90 days thereafter shall submit or resubmit to the city council the name of the appointee. So in theory, the mayor could resubmit over and over again. That clearly was not the intent. When we discussed this at the charter review, the point was that sometimes the mayor, for instance, when a new mayor comes into office, has to act quickly brings names to council, they may not have really had an opportunity to get to know more ab about the person. Historically, the mayor didn't lobby the council in advance on appointments. That was something we discussed at Charter Review. Um, so the point is, we, we again, we discussed this at the Charter Review Commission, that there are going to be occasions where someone is not confirmed by the council, and then the mayor may want to take the opportunity to 
give the council members more time to learn more about that person, to interview that person, whatever, and this would give the mayor the ability to do that. Councilman Good. I respect everybody's opinion, but we had challenges with this from day one. You recall, I asked several times that the uh, supposed at time appointee be recognized by council so council members can be able to talk to that appointee to see if they're the fit uh, for the city and to uh, muster their vote. Uh, and we had difficulties. We start, start to do that a little bit, then we dropped off, then we start to do it again. So I appreciate those efforts. But this is clear. And I don't understand why we, we're having discussion on this one here. We all sat through the process of these, our citizens, and they were angry about this. And th it is a nomination. The mayor is nominating someone, and this body here gives a confirmation, which is an appointment. And from that point, the mayor could do whatever he or she wants to do with that appointee, hire, fire, whatever. It got nothing to do with that. But I got to look at the before process and to say, a body, uh, this body has a, a, a nominee, nominee come before us and we can't get a vote on it, that, that's asinine. I, I just think that it's, the intent is perfect. Councilman Carlson. Ms. Zellman. Sorry to make you get up again. Yes. It, when the, um, sorry, I don't remember exactly when it was. Um, Somebody said December, but when we, when city council voted to confirm whatever word you want to use, the police chief, uh, the, the last police chief. I think it um, was in February of last year. Okay, February. Um, sorry, my memory's not that great on dates. <laughs> but um, anyway, on in that vote, uh, I think it was four to two, uh, but let's say it was the other way around, and four voted at that time, had four voted against whatever you want to call the person, the, the nominee, whatever, what would have happened by the charter as it was then? The mayor would have had the ability to resubmit that name or she would have submitted another name. Mm -hmm. but, but the fact is that under the charter as it is now, the mayor cannot, without any changes to the charter, the mayor cannot put somebody in a position without city council approval. Is that correct? Correct. You have to confirm her appointment. And so we're not taking away the power, whatever we call it, we're not taking away the power of the mayor to appoint people. We've always had the power to reject. I mean, does that go back to 74 or, or just, just the power to say no? Does that go to the original charter, do you know? I don't know offhand. But it's, it, 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 so we're not changing the, the basic nature well, of it. I, it's, think you, I, I mean, it's a strong mayor, for, but I'm just talking about on, that, matter, on, the, on this I mean, point. Yeah. Uh, but what's happened is it's been interpreted in the other way. So the next thing was one of the things that the public really was upset about is when when the when the police chief was nominated, whatever you want to call, the mayor said, "This is my my choice." But it had not come; bef the vote had not come before city council yet. Instead of calling that person uh, interim police chief, she called the person the police chief. Here is the police chief. Well, technically, by the charter, was that person the police chief, not the interim police chief? Was that person the the, the police chief before city council voted to approve? I think under the charter, the, the, you ha she has to fill a vacancy, and, and I think there's other, someone told me this, that under some law enforcement unique thing, there has to be a police chief in place, whether you call them interim, acting, But don't you whatever. think for the, maybe for legal purposes, it had yeah. to be called something else, but don't you think it would have been more accurate and respectful to call the person interim? Whatever, uh, just like I think someone said, uh, Chief Burkall now is called interim. Right. It, isn't that... Right. Um, the fire chief was called interim in the meantime, but for some reason that particular one didn't use the word interim, and that's why the public felt strong-armed in it. Do, do, I mean, do, by the old charter, don't that person was not permanent because city council had not approved the person, right? It Correct. still was an interim position. Correct. And so Until we're not were changing confirmed. that those points. City council has <laughs> always had the power to reject or approve, and um, and the title is not permanent until the city council. Until but just as coming. you're saying, words matter, you know, whether you call them interim, acting, or the police chief, words matter whether you say the mayor gets to nominate or appoint, or city council gets to confirm or appoint. You're taking the appointment away from her by making this change. And, I, and you know, and this goes to the question that, that Councilman Sitar asked me earlier. If what I heard the mayor say was that she wants to work with the council to find solutions to these issues. 
something like a process, you could, you could adopt a resolution saying that we hereby resolve that we will not confirm an appointment if the following hasn't happened. And you so, could talk about interviews with that person. So don't you think Whatever that... Whatever it is that you want that could fix what you think went wrong. Don't you think that objection should have been brought up when we were discussing it a few right. months ago? Um, I, and, from my personal perspective, when I tried to speak at the first council workshop, it was, I felt, and maybe I misread the room, that you didn't want to hear from the administration. You asked for outside counsel, not have our office involved. So we, we did stop raising objections. So let me, before my time runs out, sorry to cut you off. I know the chair's gonna cut my time here in a second. Um, I wanna ask a final question though. Whatever we call it, let's say that you, you, let's say that this administration believes that the word appoint means that somehow city council has some power over this person. Isn't it true that even if this passes, that that person will continue to report to the mayor and that the mayor will, yes. will do the, the annual survey? City council will have nothing to do with it. And, and even with the situation with the last police chief, could we have, could city council have fired that person? No. And, and even with these changes, can city council, with these, when these, if these changes are approved by voters, can city council fire that person or change their salary or, 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 or review them in any kind of negative way or have any kind of administrative power over them whatsoever? I believe the salary is part of the budget, so you do okay. have a say in that. But, but still, they no. report to the mayor. Correct. Even whatever we call Correct. it, we can call it pointy. And so really it is, it is not that this person somehow by changing one word now reports to city council. You know, one of the, one of the proposals I had was to, to give us the right to fire the city attorney and the mayor didn't like that one. Um, but uh, anyway, I mean, you ultimately report to the mayor. We can't, we have no control over any of these positions other than to say yes or no in that vote, correct? Well, you have the city clerk cannot be fired without a vote of city council and I believe the city council attorney would not be able to be fired without obviously the vote of city council. So you do have some say. But yeah, these are the department heads report to the mayor and she's the one who hires and fires. That's and just a last iteration, if, if we found that one of the mayor's staff people were doing something unethical or legal, we still can't fire them, right? No, but you could certainly report it to the mayor. You could certainly make a motion asking the city to look into it. I mean, there's <laughs> action the city council can take. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Does anyone in chambers wish to speak to this? Good morning, Council. Stephanie Pointer. Um, I'd like to understand why we keep trying to backstep and use the word ordinance when we've gotten this far in, in, in the conversation. It's like, okay, let's throw this car away and go back and get a new one. We're going to walk back there, but we're going to go get a new one. Um, I, I just, I, I, it's dumbfounding to me to keep having this conversation over and over again. And you know what? Bottom line is the CRA hiring process looked good. The police chief hiring process, not so much. And the citizens were really ticked off about the hiring process for the chief because they weren't included. And they, and you know, and for whatever reason, the gentleman who was the interim did, did not get included in the public forum. So bottom line is all we're talking about is a temporary employee. This is a temporary job. This isn't the permanent position. This is just for the temporary job. So let's act like that instead of making this all day long affair. Any other comments? Oh. Joe Robinson. Receive and file. Is that standard? Uh, I can get up here. So I'm good? All right. Okay. Any other comments from council? Place your votes and record. Motion carried with Miranda and Maniscalco voting no. Ordinance number 2023-3. Councilman Hurtak. Sure. I mean, no one else is jumping. I'll do it. Um, 
I move to override the veto of the mayor for an ordinance relating to the government of the city of Tampa, Florida, submitting to the electors of the city a proposed amendment to the revised charter of the city of Tampa of 1975 as amended to amend section 2.02 .02 to revising term limits of city council members to limit the ability of members of city council to serve more than a total of four consecutive full terms effective with the city of Tampa election in 2027 providing an effective date. Second. Motion made by Councilwoman Hurtak, seconded by Councilwoman Maniscalco. Any discussion? Yes, sir. Councilwoman Maniscalco. I am going to support this because I disagree with the point here that uh, there's a possibility of a uh, seven new council members with a new mayor or whatever without staggered terms and no institutional knowledge. Uh, I disagree with that because in 2011 it was a majority new city council members and a new mayor, but things worked out and they had their knowledge from whatever backgrounds and uh, I didn't see chaos or anything in an issue there. So I'm going to be supporting this. Thank you. Any other council members? Councilman Carlson. Yeah. The, if the administration had concerns about the staggering of, of uh, seats, then they could have talked about that months ago. Mm -hmm. um, uh, th this will happen because people come and go anyway. It will happen naturally. Um, but but I just want everybody to know this one, despite what the mayor did, uh, has said that this usur these usurp the power of, of the of the mayor's office. This this one takes away the power of the city council. We're limiting ourselves. <laughs> um, we're saying that we cannot run again. Um, so that means when when Charlie Miranda is almost a hundred, he can't run again. So. <laughs> Um, but um, the rest of us are going to get be done a lot earlier. We're limiting ourselves here, and so I want I just want the record to be clear that that we're in favor of limiting ourselves. Also, we're just trying to put good government forward. Thank you. It is of my opinion that I've heard so many times today. Let's leave it up to the voters. Mm -hmm. I have no intention, hopefully when I'm reelected, to run after that. If we're going to leave it up to the voters for these charters amendment. We should also leave it up to the voters on who they want to elect. Thank you. Is there? I was going to say uh, the same thing. Uh, I might be here if I ever get like to be 100. But I do have longevity. My grandmother died in 96. My uncle passed away about eight months ago at 94. And my other aunt died at 97 about six months ago. So, you know, it's funny. you. Uh, you take away the same things you're giving away by, by this item here, but that's all right. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Any other speakers within chambers to this? Can I just add to that? I, I always say that Charlie Miranda is the healthiest of all of us and probably the sharpest of all of us. He no. definitely tells the best jokes, so um, I hope he lives to be way past 100. <laughs> then shall we record our votes? Excuse me, replace... Do we have, I, I thought Stephanie Pointer was up here in, in Joseph Robinson. No, nope. no there wasn't? No, Sorry. Come on up here, public. Give us your comments on this. It's the same um, and we've got Chief Bennett. You first. Again, thank you, Council John Bennett, Chief of Staff. Again, lifting from the mayor's veto memo. <clears throat> I think the staggering of terms comports to the concern of the process not being elongated. The benchmark process was the CRC. Um, obviously, it's highlighted down below, as voted against this proposal in 2017. It's not that we can't change or find new ways to get through things, but I think the concern from the administration is the coincidence of turnover and institutional knowledge for the city moving forward. Yes, it can happen, but usually with incumbents, it tends to happen less frequently. So by doing it this way, again, fleshing it out over a longer period of time, which was done a couple of years ago with the CRC, was her point in that memo. Thank you. Public comment, please. Stephanie Pointer, if you wanted staggered terms, you should have asked for it. Sorry, not sorry. Any other comments? Place your votes and record. Motion carried with Miranda and Citro voting no. That's tough. 
because of a cross. Yeah, just to add one more thing. Um, one of the allegations the administration has thrown is that we're, we're bringing up back issues that were reviewed by the, the Charter Review Commission. This one in part was, um, and I was one of the proposers of it. I'm not the one that originally brought this concept up. I think I amended it at some point. But the others were not uh, proposed and rejected. Um, this one, though, when I had talked about it in the Charter Review Commission, I combined it with setting better term limits for the mayor. And the last mayor was against term limits for himself, so he fought against both of these. So that's how it ended the last time. Thank you. We now are going to be discussing the uh, veto of ordinance number 0223-4. Okay. Um, I make a motion to override the veto of an ordinance relating to the government of the city of Tampa, Florida, submitting to the electors of the city a proposed amendment to the revised charter of the city of Tampa of 1975 as amended to amend section 5.01 to provide for the citizen review board to select a legal counsel who is not a city employee to advise the citizen review board with funding provided by the city providing an effective date. Second. We have a motion that is made by Councilwoman Hertak, seconded by Councilman Goods, any discussion? Councilman Vieira. Uh, yeah, and, and I had a question for Mr. Shelby. I wanted to make sure about this because this is this is relevant. Which is once if if this is passed and the voters ultimately support this, isn't it true that we need an ordinance to implement this? And isn't it true that within that ordinance we could deal with issues such as uh, the budget and the issues not directly defined into charter language? Is that true? Well, with regard to the budget, I think you'd have to be more specific. Certainly, you have the budgetary ability whenever the, the budget is presented to you. Um, Councilman Vieira, um, presently, your ordinance, 18-8, uh, subsection H6, presently provides for an assistant city attorney serving as the legal advisor to the CRB and shall not be an assistant city attorney who advises the department uh, provided, however, there exists a conflict of interest as defined by the state or the city's ethics law or the Florida bar rules as determined by the city attorney, the city attorney may engage outside counsel for the provision of legal advice to the CRB on such matters for which such conflict exists. And I believe there is a, uh, a, a, a companion, I suspect, that, to call it that, um, uh, an executive order. But with regard to your specific question, if this does get presented to the voters and the voters do pass that, the charter provision will then make this ordinance inconsistent with the charter and this ordinance would have to be amended in so order to be consistent. If, if I may, uh, Mr. Chair, so no, I asked that question because I think for many uh, people in the public, the CRB is something that's very important. We want to make sure there's not unintended consequences. To me, for purposes of the public, all this does is right now there is a city attorney who serves as the attorney for the board. Um, and this merely has a, 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 an attorney who is not directly a, a city employee. And nothing radical is changing from this at all. The main issue that I think that I want to address is to make sure that we still have to do an ordinance once it passes to implement it um, so that it just isn't self-executing and that if there's any unintended consequences that uh, arise not from the direct language of the, of the uh, of the uh, charter amendment, the proposed charter amendment, that that can be addressed responsibly. That was why I asked that, and I thank you for your answer. And sir, uh, in addition to that, just obviously stating that whatever ordinance council ad adopts will have to be presented to the mayor. Councilman Maniscalco. So I didn't know this, that on June 28, 2022, the CRB voted six to two that they, that they did not want an independent council because they were satisfied, satisfied with the status quo. But per the code changes that we as city council voted for in 2021, an assistant city attorney who does not represent the T, uh, TPD will serve as the CRB's legal advisor, which we knew that from 2021 because we voted for it. And also in 2021, it allows already for the hiring of an outside attorney in the case of a conflict. It says the CRB has never asked to invoke that code provision. I don't know until recently if that has been invoked. And I look at it as wants and needs. Is this absolutely necessary the board voted that they did not want it and now because of what we voted for okay i've been here through the whole crb process since 2015 in 2021 it already allows them to hire an outside attorney in the case of a conflict this is what it's saying here 
So is this necessary is my question, and what will it cost regardless? I'm confused. I, I thought the tape, but I thought the president, the board chairman, came to see council and said that they did support that. I remember that. I remember that too. Excuse me. I remember that. I, I mean, I don't know where that came from, but even in the paper, I, mean, I don't believe much the paper said about these days, but the president, uh, the chair, the chairman came to city council and told us because it was the discrepancy that was going on and came here and told us that they supported that. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't say just let city council do it. That's what he said. I, I didn't hear that, but I'm sorry. That's what he said. That's what he said. So, I mean, I don't know why we... <laughs> if, if I may just clarify... There were two issues that they were talking about. One was giving the CRB a subpoena power, and one was the outside attorney. They voted six to two that they did not want the outside attorney on the subpoena power. They came to council and said, "We vote to, for you to take that to the voters." That was that was the distinction. Councilman Hertz. So I uh, I just want to ask you. Um, I mean, this, this outside attorney is just going to work by the hour. We're not hiring someone new for this. So, and that board is only here for now. That board is going to change over. We're, we're doing something that will live throughout the board and that the citizens, I mean, literally, we get a packed room every time we talk about this. So I would absolutely argue that the public really does want this, and it's not going to be that expensive because they, oh, that person is only being paid when they're working on this actual issue. It's going to be somebody who's not a part of the city. Councilman Carlson. It's not going to cost very much money. It also, by the way, is not an attack on the police department, despite what the administration says. Having objective legal counsel doesn't, it in fact should help the police uh, officers who are going through this process. Um, all this does is this provides objectivity. <clears throat> I, the, some of the charter amendments I proposed would have fixed the conflict of interest of the, of the city attorney. Um, the city attorney by charter represents the mayor, the city council, the, 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 the board members of these committees and others, um, as well as the city. There's an inherent conflict of interest there and we know that uh, from proven record that some city attorneys have misinterpreted the charter, in particular in and around this issue. The most recent one, which we're gonna discuss later today, is 2018, city attorney wrote a two paragraph memo without telling city council that, guess what? We don't have to go before city council to get approval for settlements anymore. That was completely illegal. He also said in, the, in that memo that it, that it squashed any prior ordinances. The charter does not allow that. It was an illegal, um, in the private sector, we would file lawsuits about that to stop people from misinterpreting charter. All this does is that since the city attorney reports to the mayor, it makes sure that the independent, that the legal counsel, imagine you get a, a mayor who's anti-police, that it could work against the police in that situation too. An outside attorney has to, by bar rules, give independent counsel. Thank you. Councilman Miranda. Thank you. I, as I heard it, there, if there's a dispute, between the parties, then they hire an outside counsel to settle the dispute. Am I correct, uh, city attorney? Presently? Under the current code, yes. If the, if the um, CRB determines that there's a conflict of interest and the city attorney looks at it, if she determines, he or she determines that there is a conflict, they can hire outside counsel. I actually wanted to clarify the one thing. I heard two of you say, oh, this won't cost that much. As someone, and, and Morris could actually speak to this even more than me, as someone who's currently signing the invoices for outside counsel, which we're trying to keep those costs under control, it is very expensive. The, the days when attorneys outside the city were willing to take city work at a, at a significantly discounted rate are over. Um, in order to get decent attorneys, we're paying relatively high hourly rates, and you can't expect an attorney to just come to a board meeting and sit there for two hours and only charge for those two hours. They need to prepare for it. They need to read the agenda. They need to read the backup documentation. They need to take the calls from the um, board members in between. Um, it, it, I, you would be shocked at how quickly hours get ratcheted up and bills get bigger and bigger. And I just, I, 
we really need to flesh that out because it's, it's just not accurate to say, oh, this won't cost much. I mean, it depends on what you think is much, but the legal fees that we're paying outside counsel add up pretty quickly. Councilwoman Hertak. Um, what percentage of the $1.9 billion budget does it cost to have outside counsel? That, I, I hear what you're saying. I can tell you that we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars every year on outside counsel. Hundreds so that's, that's not even close to 1% or a portion of 1%, correct? No, I'm just asking. Is that correct? I, I, I wasn't tired to do math, so I don't know. That I <laughs> but, but, we can, but we can say pretty clearly that okay. it's less than one half of 1%. If, that, if that's, okay. As I said, different people have different definitions of the word not cost that much. To me, hundreds of thousands of dollars is a lot of money, but I hear what you're saying. Anyone else? Chief Bennett. And John Bennett, Chief of Staff, once again, lifting the part of the mayor's memo on the veto. Um, just to answer a few questions that I heard, $100,000, the way I understand it, would outfit a single officer with their hiring and their equipment. So just for some relativity on that, because it would come from the general fund, as my understanding. So just a detail there. I think the reason that the mayor wanted to meet with all of you is because two things. One, the CRB did vote this down. And that's why it was put in the memo. And then secondly, we went through a very intense exercise to revamp. The mayor was the one that took away the executive order and worked with council to build an ordinance to work together collaboratively on this. And she didn't know what had changed between then and now that this had to go into the charter. And then the last point, there is nothing in the charter now about this area. So now we have a one-off in the charter that deals with something that had already been addressed by ordinance. And then the very last postscript to that is we can use an ordinance or amend the current ordinance to get exactly what we're working on. And she said she was committed to working with council on that. Councilman Hurtak. Um, Chief Bennett, you were in my meeting with the mayor. Um, I just want a quick yes or no. Did, did she ask me that question? I'm sorry, what question would that be? Uh, about whether or not um, we really need this and talk, no, did, her, did we talk about this particular ordinance or at all? Her question was an open-ended question about helping her understand all of the items from council's perspective. But I'm making sure that because I don't want it to seem like we had that conversation because we did not because she did not ask me that question. But she was the one that opened the door to get the feedback of why this was necessary. That's Not why she had the meeting one, no. and asked an open-ended question to everybody that I sat in is, help me understand these changes. I, just, Council, it's a difference of opinion. Councilman Carlson. If I, Chief, if I remember correctly, um, shot spotter costs like $250,000 a year, and it's been proven to be completely ineffective um, out of 500 calls that wasted police officer time. Police officers complain about having to go to wasted time and go away from real crimes. Um, it resulted in 25 charges that probably were all called in by 911 anyway. Um, so for 250,000, how many officers could we hire for that? Two and a half, based on your question. And then, but and then there are two software the pack. There are two software. Pa that's another discussion for another day. But there are two software packages that that uh, police officers have to fill out, and they complain that it's redundant. It's taking a lot of time uh, to fill to fill out two systems and, and they should be spending that time in the field. I mean, that time alone could free up a lot of time. And the, my last question related to this is, if, uh, if the mayor had put out the Hannah Avenue project to bid the, uh, instead of just signing off for $108 million and we, and we saved $5 million by, let's say 5% by putting it out for bid, how many police officers could we have hired for $5 million? Divided by 100,000. Yeah. I mean, the biggest issue with the police officers right now is that they they are stressed out and they want more officers to help to help fill out the core and they want less paperwork. They want to be able to focus on building uh, trust in the community. Um, this having independent counsel protects the public. The reason why this is here is because at least the prior administration created um, hostile policies that oppressed the East Tampa, oppressed the black community. And it's caused uh, Tampa to have a horrible reputation. Right now, 
right now, even though the administration tried to hide it, um, we're under the second civil rights investigation in seven years because of it, because of programs that, that the last mayor and his police chief of police, who's now the mayor, created. And, and these are just two programs that were found through investigative reports by the Tampa Bay Times. Imagine what else is out there that we don't know about. These are not programs that were created by the police officers. In fact, the police officers don't like them. They're, uh, they're programs created because we had uh, people on top of the city who, cr who intentionally created racist programs that oppressed. And the public, as part of the settlement for that, wanted the CRB. And then prior administrations uh, tried to edit the CRB down. And all the public is simply asking for now is give us an attorney who doesn't report to the mayor. Because if we get another, another mayor who insists on uh, protecting, defending, and hiding racist policies, we want an attorney that we can rely on that tells the truth. Understood. And just a, a couple points of clarification. That's exactly what the mayor did in the last ordinance is made a provision for an outside attorney to support counsel and the CRB and the public after a, a, an elongated workshop with the public hosted by USF. And by the way, DOJ and BGA just brought over almost 40 personnel here from major cities because they do believe that the Tampa Police Department is running the best and brightest operation. And are they not interviewing people right now about renting while black? I don't, They're I don't in the know process the of their that. investigation. I just know that DOJ had a lot of faith in our jurisdiction. And I, and I should say also, and officers. I should also say, and I kind of said this before, having an objective attorney also protects the police officers. Mm -hmm. Imagine how vulnerable the police officers are having to go through this public process. They, I'm sure, would want an objective attorney because they don't want any politics inserted in this at all. So all we're asking for is, uh, is uh, there was so much money being wasted in this administration. We need objectivity. We need to pay for an outside counsel because uh, we haven't gotten it in the past. Thank you. And we also believe that that can be accomplished by ordinance. The, the big concern with the, with the charter is that we didn't hear any scope. The scope of money, the scope of selection process, the scope of protecting the CRB as a body who's doing the volunteer work. We wanted to hear all of that scope coming together. We hadn't heard that. So that was the, the reason the mayor vetoed, is to understand more of that scope and why she invited everybody to the table to have a better understanding of that. Councilman Vieira. Uh, thank you very much. There's three things, which is w when I had suggested that uh, the, uh, the, the outline in terms of how we go, I mean, I, uh, this is kind of, and again, not uh, uh, Chief Bennett, not Councilman uh, Carlson, not pointing at either one, but just to move this forward. Um, because I think people know how they're going to vote, et cetera. Um, and, and just really quick, just, just a, a, a point, I guess, if you will, with regards to, I, I tried in effort to call it an independent attorney, but a separate attorney. I'll give you all, uh, just as an attorney, an example. Let's say you get into an accident and you're insured by Allstate. Allstate gives you an attorney who works for Allstate in-house, just like a city attorney works for the city of Tampa in-house. They are, by virtue of their being a member of the Florida Bar and the Florida Bar Ethics Rules, an independent attorney, even though they are paid for directly by Allstate. Allstate may alternatively wish to go to an outside law firm uh, who they pay, just like the city will pay that outside attorney. Both of them have the very same ethical duties uh, to the client, just like the city attorney has the same ethical duties to the CRB, just like the outside attorney would have the same ethical rules to the CRB. Thank you very much. Ms. Zellman. Uh, first, Chief Bennett, and then I'll ask Ms. Zellman. Uh, I just heard something earlier that Shot Spotter was paid for out of the general fund. That's paid for by grant that was received by uh, the police department. I believe Shot Spotter started out with a grant. I'd have to get with our CFO and, and that group. But I think it started out with a grant, and sometimes grants convert over either in part and whole to a uh, general fund process. So, we'd so have that, to is, get... that is money that's not being spent out of the general fund. From the beginning, yeah. Yes. I'd have to get you the history of it. I don't have that at my fingertips. I'm good with that. Uh, Ms. Zellman, do we have any voting record of the members of the CRB on this particular issue? I have it upstairs, yes. I, I can get it. I, well, I, I, I'm, I, it was 6-2 against six, two, yeah. it. Uh, we have a representative from a human rights organization. Do we know how that representative voted? I'm not sure I understand the question. On, on, on no, no, on, on the CRB. Oh, I don't know. I'd have to look. I, I mean, I have the minutes of that meeting and the vote in a notebook upstairs. Okay. And if you want, I can thank get you. it. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, we will now take public comment at this time.
Uh, hello, my name is David Jones, District 7. Um, yeah, so uh, I organize with the Tampa Bay Community Action Committee. Uh, right now we're having people DM us talking about uh, experiences they've had with police brutality. Um, they're DMing us um, pictures of their bruises that they uh, received from the police. They're telling us all the details. Um, we're also a volunteer group um, led by uh, truly a lot of people coming either out of college, people who work full time, people who uh, do not have the range to do that truly. Um, but what we do have is this CRB that is funded uh, by the city that does have some actual uh, influence that can be doing something. But because of the way it's currently run, people uh, don't feel comfortable going there. Uh, right now, this vote is to uh, make it so that uh, the people in Tampa can vote to make it well what they need it to be and something that can actually help them. Um, there's only so much we can do. There's only so many resources we can point people towards. There's only so much we can help out with. But um, if this board is there to like uh, review these cases to make sure that the police are being held accountable to uh, demand that there's actual transparency happening. Uh, it needs to happen from the uh, people who are like being paid to do it. Uh, so I uh, think that putting this on the ballot and making sure that it can be shaped the way that the need, the way that the people need it to be shaped is completely necessary. Uh, vote, help, hoping y'all uh, overrode us. Thank you. Taylor Cook, Tampa Bay Community Action Committee. Um, this is getting ridiculous. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, but we have been here all day. Like Lynn Hertak said, we the room is always packed when y'all talk about the CRB. So why are we still debating this? Why are we debating it again? We have been here every time saying we want this and we want to vote on this. So why are we continuing to be like, oh, I don't know if it's possible. Then why was it voted on? Why did it vote and pass? We should be allowed to vote. Are you going to let democracy stand in the city of Tampa or are you going to let it die? I, you tell me. This is ridiculous. We've been here all day debating the same thing. Are you going to let us vote or not? That's the question. Not if the CRB said yes or no. It's what the people want. We want to vote. We're here because we are saying we want to vote. So let us vote. Thank you. No Myers, Tampa Bay Community Action Committee. I just want to contextualize those CRB meetings and how that uh, uh, city attorney actually goes. There was a point in time where we had a discussion about subpoena power at the CRB meetings, and I watched as the, the city hired attorney misled the CRB about what the subpoena power was capable of. And there have been complaints about the city attorney. The ACLU has mentioned how and many times he had leaned on the CRB to hurry decisions and, and to hurry investigations. I, it's just not, it just isn't a rational thing to do, to have somebody who has a clear conflict of interest, as Councilman uh, Bill, Hurt, uh, Bill Carlson has said, uh, with the police department. And it just doesn't make any sense when we're trying to investigate them for things that they did, right? I, it just, it really is to benefit of no one, and we're still doing it. And, but, and then again, we just want to vote on it. Like, it's a very simple thing to do. Uh, and I'm sure all of you kind of understand that. It's just, this is a weird circumstance. And we shouldn't be in it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rick Pfeiffer. Um, when I watched these discussions back in December, um, a couple things just make common sense to me. If you're going to have a citizen's review board, it needs to have some autonomy because I see a lot of people, people that I know in the black and brown communities, that there's a great deal of mistrust. And we need to rebuild that. And if autonomy allows that to be rebuilt, it, that's the way to go at, with the independent council. But I will also tell you, I also took a different tack than what you all voted for regarding subpoena power. Because you know what, if somebody, and some of y'all are lawyers, if somebody wants me to come and talk to them, and I don't want to talk to them, minus the subpoena, I don't have to show up. You hand me that subpoena, I've got to show up. And that makes that much more accountable to the community. And the bottom line is council should be doing their best to build trust in the communities that feel that they don't have trust with the police department now or that anybody is going to fairly and objectively hear their concerns. Thank you. Stephanie Pointer. James Michael Shaw asked me to read this statement, please. They were misinformed by counsel for Tampa PD that it was a full-time position. 
Several of them said that they thought that they were voting against a full-time position, uh, a full-time attorney. The 62 vote was not a vote that they didn't want a part-time attorney to be independent. Don't be misled. Hello, Council. Robin Lockett. Um, taxpayer money, taxpayer vote. It's frustrating to sit here and uh, see nickel and diming of taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. Taxpayer money, taxpayer vote. I don't understand why, why it's, it is so difficult to put it on the ballot and let people vote. If they agree with it, they agree with it. If, if, and everybody has to do work to get the work out, to get the word out, right? You guys have to do the work, uh, the, do, do the work to get the word out in regards to where you stand. Community has to rally together to get the word out to uh, confirm where we stand. So put it on the ballot. I, I don't understand. We're going back and forth. And like the young lady said, we've been here for a long time, mulling over, retalking, rethinking, and, and, and coming up with offers that should have happened before this came to this point right now. Amen. So we can't undo stuff. And all the compromising that should have happened should have happened beforehand. So put it on the ballot and let's vote. Joe Robinson, let me point of clarification. I was around when the biking while black occurred. I used to be the first vice president in NAACP. I was there when the US attorney briefed us before they briefed the community. Let me explain something to you. This whole thing got co-opted. Now I'm gonna have to tell the truth a little bit here. Uh, when the administration made a phone call to Virginia and we want cops to come here and investigate this back and wild black. Cops has no uh, <coughs> enforcement authority. Their recommendations, you can throw them in the, in the garbage can. You can get it over here. The Justice Department never ever was involved because the letter that the NAACP went was getting ready to write, was held up so long till they had came to their report and said, this is what we're going to do. It had over 100 recommendations. And by the time we had the presentation for the U.S. attorney, they were always half completed. So let me get that straight. Justice Department never really looked at this. It was only by cops out of Virginia. Look it up. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, we are missing a council member for this vote. So... I think we need to wait until we have the council member here. There oh, there we are. Uh, and I, I just also wanted to say that um, this was a unanimous vote on second reading. Yeah. Yeah. Any other further discussion? Place your votes and record. Motion is not sustained due to a majority, not due to a majority vote. Carlson, Vieira, Hertek, and Gruz voting yes. That's only four. Miranda, Maniscalco, and Citro voting no. Three. So it's a four-to-three vote. Oh, okay. Councilwoman Hertek. Well, um, if you said this has to be an ordinance, then um, I just want to make it an ordinance. If, if y'all are saying the reason you're not going to pass it today, so I'm going to expect you to pass it today right. as an That's ordinance, right. and I'm going to expect you to pass it on second reading as an ordinance I if mean, this uh, was your concern. No one's, so, going to tell me, no one's going to tell me how to vote. Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying? That's what you're telling no, me? No. Th this is what th I, uh, these folks, I'm not talking to you, I'm talking oh. to them, and I have the floor right now. I'm sorry. So um, right now, I'm going to pass an ordinance relating to the government of the city of Tampa, Florida, that Process, please. I think a motion in that point, in this point in time, would be out of order with what council has decided it was. Okay, going to do. then I'll do it later. Thank you. Ordinance number two zero two three dash four. Last one. Last one. Last one. Last one. Last one. Last one. 
We're going to the last one. That's right. Correct me. I'm sorry. Uh, ordinance number 2023-5. I have an ordinance being presented for second reading and adoption ordinance relating to the government of the city of Tampa, Florida, submitting to the electors of the city a proposed amendment to the revised charter of the city of Tampa of 1975 as amended to amend section 10.10 .10 to correct a scrivener's error and to provide that commencing in 2025, a Charter Review Advisory Commission be established every eight years instead of every 10 years, and legal counsel and a professional facilitator for the commission be hired within city council approval, providing an effective date. Second. We have a second huh? uh, motion. This is, to, this is a motion to override the mayor's veto. This is a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. Any discussion? Councilman Maniscalco. I read oh, this, so I am in, in support of this. Uh, we did have a Charter Review Commission established for the first time, which uh, some of us voted for that, uh, and many of us were on that board, not myself, but four members here, and they did a very, very good job. I think that uh, reconvening the or convening a Charter Review Commission uh, at, a more f at a higher frequency uh, is healthy because you have a full board with full discussion to overlook charter issues, and this is coming around the corner in 2025, so any issues, whatever they may be, can be uh, brought up and voted on and then brought up to council and the voters, so I'm in full support of this. Councilman Miranda. As I understand, this is just correcting your Scribner's error? No. This is increasing the frequency from every 10 years to 8 years, so it'll be in line with the next election, giving time for the commission to meet and discuss and have a, you know, I would draw my second. If I can, if I, um, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Um, I believe this is a, a minor Scrivener's error that's unrelated to the substance. Is that correct? Is, is, um, Mr. Massey, I see him nodding yes. But, the, but, but it is as, as council, uh, city council had talked about changing it from every 10 years to every eight years um, and changing the date that it would start that much sooner as to what is presently in the charter. Is there a second to Councilman Maniscalco? We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Goods. Is there any further discussion? Chief Bennett. Thank you, John Bennett, Chief of Staff. Good afternoon again. Just sticking with the process of informing the public on the mayor's memo. Um, the highlighted area talks about specifically what the concern about has been all along is that council can already invoke a CRC anytime they want over and above other processes that have been designed for a 10 year span. So, you know, we all know what we could do. And then there's the question of what other options there were. So the mayor just wanted to make sure that council was uh, informed on the, the position that you can bring a CRC back and have a more prolonged process to make sure we get full-throated engagement before something went in a highly responsible way to the public. Thank you. Is there anyone in chambers wishing to give public comment? Good, Good afternoon, whatever it is. Stephanie Pointer, um, I'd like to point out that if we had a charter, we, we didn't have a charter review this time, and that's like some of the complaints from the people who are opposed to these charter amendments. So what you're saying is we don't like the way you did it this time, but we also don't want you to do it a different way. Hmm. I'm just so confused. <laughs> Anyone else? This is it, man. Is it, is it standing that that received into the record, so we have a complete record yes. of what all, they said. All Everything. five. All right. One out of five. That ain't bad. Take, it easy, Take care. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Anyone else in chambers who wishes to speak to this? Councilman Miranda. I, it just, I'm looking at it, and uh, it used to be every 10 years, but then this city council, without having any input from anyone from the community who sat in the Charter Review Committee, decided to do it four years later. So now we're giving eight years instead of four. That's what it really is, because we, we violated our own intent by not having a committee of citizens selected to give us the input from their community to make sure that we knew what we were talking about. That's all I'm going to say. Anyone else? I will say this. 
I'm sorry, you're, you're waving if somebody in, in, in chambers wanting to give public comment. Please, Ms. Lockett, I, that's why I keep asking, is there anyone else? So again, this is just, I, I'm frustrated. So if this is put on, when this is put on the ballot, whether we have a meeting or not, a lot of those committed meetings are handpicked by people, not the true community. So if you uh, put this on the ballot, People can vote on it. That's a wider spread. Yep. A small group of people that's chosen by somebody to sit on a, on, on a committee, it does not speak for the people. So put it on the ballot and let everybody vote for it. Yep. It's, it's, it's simple. Y'all are nickel and diming and, 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 and it's frustrating. Thank you. I was on the charter review. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pointer. I didn't say that. We had met, it took 13 months for the charter review. Now we're going to ask that this be put down in time so the charter could be reviewed more often. And put in a time when we're going to have elections. Place your vote and record. Motion carried with Miranda voting no. Councilman Carlson. Mr. Chair, I apologize for stepping out a minute. Um, I, I was getting a drink. And while I was out there, I discovered that the, that the mayor released a push poll about me um, I have copies of the I have copies of the poll if anybody would like to see it. But she released a push poll during this meeting, um, and and what she did in her poll was she not only asked if if people would vote for me versus her, and I had already told her I wasn't running for mayor, and I had already filed to run for city council. But then she asked a whole series of defamatory and it, untrue questions about me, uh, uh, demeaning my ethics, and then she asked the question whether people would reelect me or not. And so she just put out a poll saying that only 47% of people would reelect me today. That's after asking five really nasty, negative, untrue questions. I think that's pretty successful. And I, I think it's despicable. Again, I keep talking about dirty tactics of this administration. While we're in this meeting, because they disagree with what I'm saying, they're releasing a push poll to try to distract the community's attention away from the important subjects. By the way, we're talking about toilet tap this afternoon. So public, please watch. Why can't they just play nice? Why the public doesn't want this fighting anymore. They don't want false information. They don't want dirty politics. Stop. Madam Mayor, stop. I asked you in your office on Friday, stop. Tell your people to stop. Now it's your campaign people attacking us. Why can't you play fair and have honest discussions about real policy? You just, your people are so weak and so insecure that you just have to play dirty. You know, how many times, if, you're, if, if your kid is on the field and somebody's coming and pushing them and punching them and kicking them and hitting them, are you going to do something eventually? Imagine if this is happening to me, a city council member. Imagine what's happening to the public by this administration. It is despicable. Stop, Madam Mayor. Stop. The public wants you to stop. I don't care what your poll says. Stop. Yes. Amen. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um. I'm sorry to hear about that. Uh, I also just got a request yesterday. So they've started on what they've started on with everybody else. I finally got my first public records request for all, every type of communication, no dates, no deadlines, anonymous. So now I am also under this uh, investigation and just, you know, asking, finding text messages, emails, things I've done with people. Well, you know, I stay above the board. I do what I'm supposed to do. And, I, and people say, wow, you must feel bad. And I say, no, not really, because I'm doing the right thing. I'm not worried about it. Right. And it often feels like that push where it, we always say um, that folks put their personal fears on other people. And I feel like that's what's happening here. So they're just going after all of us. That's what's happening. They want a city council that will do everything they do, and in particular, pass toilet to tap. This is the big thing that they want. They want so many bad things, and they will do anything to get these, these horrible policies passed. 
please, Madam Mayor, call a halt to these attacks. It's political season. You don't have an opponent yet. You have 24 hours. Call a halt to these attacks. This is ridiculous. Councilman Miranda. I agree with Mr. Carlson that this is an administration or an individual. Might be, I don't know who, who's doing it. I, uh, I don't even answer polls. I don't even look at them. The guy wrote me a week or so ago, John, uh, we got a poll for you to do. I didn't even open it up. I don't do those things. I don't even look at them or think about them because they're all ridiculous. Push polls are terrible. They only uh, change the subject matter to whatever they want to, the answer to be. And uh, if it's a mayor's office, they should be told to stop like you're doing. However, on the other issues, when you look at uh, people asking for public record requests, we have thousands of public record requests come through this city. And I can tell you this, I don't know what your, your <coughs> council member, her tack is. I don't know what the <coughs> subject matter was, so I, I'm not gonna address it because I don't know. But I can tell you this, no. we have been inundated by this push poll, not push poll by, by this, <coughs> public records requests to the point that we can hardly keep up with them. Yeah. And the clerk's office and those that are doing the work deserve some time of kudos because they're wearing out. Thank you very much. Councilwoman Hurst. I just wanted to reply to Councilman Miranda. That's actually the most interesting part. There's no <coughs> subject. There's no, there's nothing they're looking for. They're literally looking for every single email. And that's the thing that's just gonna, yeah, you're right. It's, it's fishing. So I, I don't disagree with you. And, but, but that's what they've done to council members that don't necessarily agree. Now, whether it's the administration or not, uh, people who are just not willing to rubber stamp, that's what's happening to us. And it's really unfortunate. And, um, you know. Council Magoos. I just want to apologize to the public today. You, you came here to listen and voice your concerns. First day on council, Mr. Miranda says, you don't get mad at somebody's vote. I had to learn that the first time. So I can't get mad how anybody voted today. Because they voted with their conscience, they voted politically, how were they voting? That's not my, my concern. My concern is how I vote and how my people tell me to vote. I don't go into politics. Don't worry about endorsements or who's gonna endorse you because like Mr. Ch Miranda said, you, you, talk, you said all the time when people vote, I, I didn't lose. I just didn't get enough votes. Exactly right. So you, you don't vote for me, it means you don't like the job I did. If you vote for me, you like the job I did. So I can't worry about an endorsement or who going to like me or who don't. I told Mr. Bennett and the mayor, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to respect anybody in a respected place. I don't have to like you, but I'm going to respect you. I don't have to like anybody. But I'm going to respect you. I'm going to do the job you tell me to do. And I'm always going to fight for the people. And when there's something not right, I will always say, hey, and I will tell the people, this is what I don't think is right, but let's do this so they'll understand. So I, I apologize for, for some who sit here all day. We've been here a while, and I wish the process would have been a, a little faster because I got frustrated myself that I thought this should have been very simple. You know, you voted, you didn't vote, you didn't like something, say something, but to have our, all the discussions are almost after 1 o'clock, I just think it's a travesty for the voters and those who came out here who missed work with other obligations. So again, I apologize for me. I can't apologize to anybody else. I can only say for me, and God bless you all. Uh, we have a time certain 1.30. Well, we're going to lunch now. In the hearing. Yes. That's true, but that's going to be continued, so it's really irrelevant what time you take it up to. we will be back at 2.30.